हेलो हेलो हाँ जी सर हाय हेलो हाउ आर यू डॉक्टर मंदीप मैं ठीक हूँ सर बिल्कुल ऑल वेल ऑल वेल एक मिनट आई एम जस्ट चेकिंग फ्यू पीपल हाँ नहीं नहीं रिसीव द लिंक्स How is everything? Right, Chandra sir. Badiya. Life is getting smoother. So we are at eight o'clock. We are not going to play. Ah, this is a big deal. Subjecting also used to start at ten o'clock in uh, December, right? Ten o'clock? Ah, sir. We are going to reach at nine. No, I mean, सर्दियों में we all used to be a bit late. There was so foggy. हाँ, मतलब PG में तो आना ही पड़ता था. ऐसा ship में शायद थोड़ा सा ढील हो गई थी. मैंने तो सर उसके बाद भी कहाँ कहाँ चंडीगढ़ में PG आए में तो सवा सात बजे घर से निकलना पड़ता था. आठ बजे तो class शुरू हो जाती थी. Digital घड़ी लगी होती थी बस उसको देख के. डॉक्टर मंदीप शेयर योर स्लाइड्स एंड चेक दैट दे आर वर्किंग वेल ठीक है हम्म इसको मैं यहां से शेयर करूं या अपनी स्लाइड से कोई शेयर स्क्रीन शेयर स्क्रीन शेयर स्क्रीन करो तो योर मेन डेस्कटॉप वुड शेयर देन यू कैन आइदर पहले से ओपन कर लो या पीपीटी ओपन आफ्टर दैट पहले पहले से ओपन कर ली सर आ रही है हम्म आ रही है इसको स्लाइड शो कर लो हाँ मैं कर रही हूँ और मेरा जरा सर एक एक दो वीडियोस हैं वो भी आप देख लेना चल रहे हैं वो भी चला के चेक कर लो हाँ मैं कर रही हूँ चल रहा है ना हम्म चल रहा है ब्यूटीफुल ठीक है अच्छा स्टॉप शेयर कर दूँ हाँ हाँ बिल्कुल
ट्वेंटी मिनट की टॉक एंड टेन मिनट फॉर डिस्कशन करते हैं ना वरना तो हाँ अब टू मतलब हेलो डॉक्टर अजय वेलकम गुड आफ्टरनून गुड आफ्टरनून यू फाइन थैंक यू आपका बैक पोस्टर बड़ा होता है ये गार्डन ऑफ फाइव सेंसेस है ये गार्डन ऑफ फाइव सेंसेस है अच्छा गार्डन ऑफ फाइव ना मैं मुंबई पर मैं आपको यहाँ का दिखा अच्छा मुंबई में हो ना गुड तो मुंबई क्या हो रहा है कोई टीओटी हो रहा है क्या तो ऐसे फैमिली फंक्शन था फैमिली फंक्शन गुड सो आई थिंक स्लोली पीपल विल जॉइन टू कीप इट ऑन टाइम डॉक्टर मंदीप एंड डॉक्टर अजय वी शुल स्टार्ट राइट हाँ सर वी शुड स्टार्ट ऑन टाइम है ना आई थिंक पीपल विल बी हैविंग लंच है ना लंच टाइम होता है काफी लोगों का स्टार्ट कर देते हैं धीरे धीरे लोग ज्वाइन करेंगे हाँ हाँ वी कैन स्टार्ट एंड पीपल कीप ऑन ज्वाइन या सो फ्रेंड्स वी वेलकम यू टू टूडेज पल्मोनरी पीडियाट्रिक पल्मोनोलॉजी सी एम ई बाई आई ए पी दिल्ली एंड यू ऑल सी वी हैव फाइव टॉक्स लाइन अप फॉर टूडे एंड थैंक्स टू अवर डी डी ए पी प्लेटफॉर्म डेली डिजिटल अकेडमी ऑफ पीडियाट्रिक्स दैट वी कुड होस्ट सच जूम Uh, link waitings where we can discuss really relevant issues for uh, specially relevant respiratory issues in present times and we are happy to welcome and we have our iap is delhi president dr ajay gupta and ciap eb 21 and 22 with us dr ajay welcome thank you dr manish good afternoon uh, yeah i would request dr ajay to give his uh, welcome words for the participants and then we can uh, move over to a speaker and start the cme dr ajay please thank you dr manish uh, i think iip delhi is doing a wonderful job uh, involving uh, all the specialties different specialty workshops have been wonderful like gastropedia neuropedia hematopedia and uh, in this uh, regard uh, today's uh, cme it's uh, very well it's very useful for all the private practitioners also so wish you all the best please go ahead thank you boss thank you dr ajay now we move on to today's cme and we have a very good uh, speaker who is a european di diplomat in respiratory diseases and is presently at max saket hospital and i am fortunate to have worked with dr mandeep pal excellent sincere pediatrician she is for the patient and we welcome dr mandeep palia to speak on uh, recurrent and chronic cough uh, welcome dr mandeep thank you sir uh, now you, over to uh, dr mandeep to give a academic session on recurrent and chronic cough we normally lot of we see lot of patients uh, these days in our clinics uh, dr mandeep please yeah thank you sir thank you for your nice words of introduction and uh, it's always a pleasure you know to uh, we have been closely associated since our uh, since you were doing senior residency and i was doing uh, my pg so from subdesk and uh, thereafter also during atm then rti jams we have been you know uh, meeting pretty often okay so coming to today's topic uh, um i think yeah are the slides properly visible yeah yeah well audible and visible too okay so the topic that i would be covering today is uh, basically chronic cough and we all know that uh, most of the children you know most of the morbidity in pediatrics nowadays is essentially you know respiratory illnesses uh, diagnostic diseases uh, you know have almost quite substantially reduced 
And amongst the respiratory diseases, of course, acute cough remains the, the most common cause. Uh, but we do see a lot of children coming to us with chronic cough. And I think in this regard, uh, this presentation is trying to basically uh, present how to approach a child with chronic cough. So we will begin with two cases. Uh, this case one is Sohail. He's a one-year-old boy who's uh, immunized, has normal growth and development, and has been having cough for the last one month, which is dry and non-spasmodic with no diurnal variation. And it initially began like any other URI illness. His past history is uh, uh, uneventful. He doesn't have a history of recurrent nebulizations. And examination-wise also, there are uh, almost normal examination. He's active and playful. And the respiratory system examination is also normal. Now, that was the first case. Now, there is a second case, Raja, who's also a one-year-old boy. He has been previously healthy, but is also suffering from one month of spasmodic barky cough. So both of them have the same uh, periodicity, of, uh, periodicity of illness. Both are one year old. But let us look at the nuances of the history here. His cough is associated with fever and noisy breathing and has been hospitalized because of respiratory distress requiring oxygen, supplemental oxygen. And uh, there is very partial response to uh, treatment with um, um, antibiotics, nebulizations, and oral steroids. Examination, he has tachypnea and retractions, and his uh, saturation is on the lower side, 90 to 91 in year. And chest examination reveals that bilateral air entry is reduced with both uh, wheezing and crackles that are audible. The rest of the systemic examination is normal. So after uh, um, you know, going through these two cases, the pertinent questions that we all need to ask, is the approach to the two cases same? How do we classify chronic cough? And then we have to identify amongst the cases with chronic cough, which are the children that need investigations and what are they? And then of course, devise a treatment plan for these children. So, before we go further, it is very important to define what really is chronic cough. Now, we all know acute cough is cough lasting for less than seven days. But chronic cough in children is defined as more than four weeks of duration of cough, whereas in adults, the cutoff is eight weeks. Now, when we are approaching a child with chronic cough, cough more than four weeks, the important points that we have to consider, like any other uh, uh, medical case, history and examination. But in both history and examination, our main purpose is to identify red flag signs if any are present. And then to characterize the cough, what is the quality, what is the sound and the pattern, what are the preliminary investigations and what are the subsequent second tier investigations. And then of course, we come to the treatment plan. So the most important thing in the history and examination is we need to find out specific cough pointers because if these are present, then that means there is an underlying definite pathological cause for this cough which needs to be investigated and then only a treatment plan would be uh, specific to that disease needs to be devised. So what are these red flag signs? Any cough that is originating in the neonatal period is abnormal. So it could be because of congenital anomalies or IU infections. Then if the child has been having daily moist cough or wet cough for more than four weeks. Now we all know that acute viral infections do begin with the wet cough, but then they don't last beyond uh, you know, four weeks uh, as a wet cough. They subsequently, after about uh, seven to 10 days, they start uh, you know, becoming dry cough. And uh, Although in small children, uh, less than six years or five years of age, they may not expect to rate the sputum, but we, don't, we can hear a phlegmy sound of their cough, which can indicate that this is a wet cough that they are having. Then the other respiratory signs like chest pain, hemoptysis, dyspnea, and tachypnea uh, would also point out to an underlying cause in cardiac abnormalities we've seen. 
If a child has been having a fever also associated with work and there is failure to thrive, definitely you know, we need to look deeper into this case. Two very important histories that we need to take in any child with respiratory chronic illness is the feeding problems and what are the kind of problems happening during sleep. So in the feeding problems, we should ask, does the child have any coughing and choking with feed? Does the child, you know, have disturbed the feed, feeding sessions? Is he becoming irritable after feeds? So all these would point out either towards some congenital anomalies of the airway, like the uh, H-type uh, uh, fistulas or aspirations uh, due to gastroesophageal reflux or foreign body. Neurodevelopmentally abnormal children can have recurrent pulmonary aspirations leading to chronic cough. If there has been recurrent pneumonias in the past, I think that history must be taken. Ke pehle kitni baar isko pneumonias and and uh, if radiological films are available, we should look into that. And any other recurrent illnesses, systemic illnesses can be appointed towards immune dysfunctions. So this is essentially in the history. And in the examination, what we need to basically see, along with cough, does the child has respiratory distress? Whatever may be the level of the respiratory distress, we need to pick that up. Any strider, any adventitious sounds, auscultatory or non-auscultatory. So strider, wheeze, repetitions, we should uh, you know, look for. Clubbing, a very, very important sign. You know, I start my examination when I get, uh, you know, chronic patients. Uh, I start with their hands and look at the clubbing. So if clubbing is present, you know, first of all, this is not asthma. This is not uh, the, just a simple case. It needs to be investigated. Any chest fall deformity, oxygen desaturation, or if there are consistent recurring chest uh, x-ray abnormalities or even if they are not recurrent a uh, simple one x-ray also if um, that is showing abnormality that is uh, good enough and spirometric abnormalities if they are present that also uh, is important but of course we can do pulmonary function tests like spirometry in only children about six or seven years of age the second step then is to characterize the cough what whether it is dry or it is wet, and what are the kind of sounds that are coming with the cough? Is, is it paroxysmal? So in paroxysmal cough, the child will have bouts of cough lasting for many seconds, but in between, the child is well for maybe even many hours. And during those paroxysms, the child may have a red flushing face, or he, uh, he may be vomiting, uh, so that is paroxysmal cough. Barking cough, which has its origin either in uh, the trachea or uh, the subglottic area. And uh, who, as we know, is one of the signs in, of pertussis, but seen in older children, not present in uh, younger infants. And again, if there is coughing while the child, so I always make the child, you know, I always uh, tell the mother to feed in front of me. And I observe the feeding session myself while the child is taking the feed, what is happening. And uh, strider, of course, a honking nature of cough. Now, uh, I will show you in the subsequent videos that could also that could be appointed towards uh, habit cough or somatic cough. So now, if we just go back and then reflect upon the two cases that I presented, so Hale, who was a one-year-old boy having the chronic cough, but um, uh, was not um, having any weight loss or past history, which was significant, examination was normal. So what do you think? Does the child have uh, uh, specific pointers? So uh, I know in Zoom meetings, I think uh, let's not uh, ask for responses, uh, but this child has no specific cough pointers. In comparison, the other child has many uh, specific cough pointers in the form of moist cough, there is fever, there is noisy breathing, he has desaturation and respiratory distress, wheeze and crackles is present. All this indicate this child definitely needs investigation to find out why the cough uh, for underlying causes. So now let's look at uh, we differentiate the causes of cough depending upon whether it is dry cough or wet cough. Now, commonest causes of dry cough, the list is not very long, but most important causes post-infectious cough. 
which could be viral or pertussis or any atypical organism like uh, uh, mycoplasma or chlamydia. Then there is a very controversial ent entity cough variant asthma, which is a debatable thing whether it really exists in children or not. Congenital airway anomalies, like for example, uh, tracheomalacia or uh, uh, you know, uh, bronchomalacia could also be there, and then uh, even tracheoesophageal fistula, foreign body aspiration, somatic cough, and in our country, even though tuberculosis is likely to produce symptom, but even if it is a dry cough, we cannot preclude uh, you know, uh, investigating for tuberculosis if there are other pointers. And uh, smoke exposure, and the other two entities like gastroesophageal reflux and upper airway syndromes. Upper airway syndrome is basically cough that is associated with sinusitis, rhinitis. These entities in childhood would not really present with dry cough alone. So there would be other pointers towards these. Now, we need to look at what really is the post infectious cough because this is the most common cause of a chronic cough that most of us would encounter. Because uh, children tend to suffer eight to 10 episodes of um, viral URIs, as we all know, in under five children. And it has been seen in the literature that uh, the cough after the, uh, these viral infections can sometimes even last up to eight to 10 weeks. So almost two, two and a half months also, this cough can last, but then the examination is normal. The child is not having any other specific cough pointers. So this is an important issue that we need to discuss with parents. And I think uh, given here are some of the median values in which different organisms would call, uh, cause you know, the cough to linger for so long. And what is really the mechanism? It is basically because there is an increase in the cough receptor sensitivity because of the flow inflammatory mediators, which tend to stimulate the afferent cough uh, reflex nerve, which goes to the brain center, and then um, you know, the efferent pathway is resulting in this cough. Also associated airway inflammation, and because the mucociliary apparatus gets disrupted, uh, those are other uh, causes for the cough uh, in post-infectious cough. So, um, so this was, uh, you know, uh, Sohail who gradually improved after just giving reassurance. No other treatment was given to Sohail because it was post-infectious cough for him. Whereas in the other case, um, if you looked at, into the investigations that we did, uh, his WBC and differentials was normal. There was no lymphocytosis, essentially ruling out, you know, things like pertussis, uh, leukopenia or neutrophilia. His hemoglobin was low, but platelets was normal, and uh, 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 mantu and blood culture were normal. His X-ray, as we can see, is revealing, you know, there are a lot of infiltrates, right more than the left, uh, but also present on the left side also. So because of these red flag signs, you know, we thought of investigating this boy. So we did a bronchoscopy, a flexible bronchoscopy was done, and let's see <clears throat> what are the findings. So we are passing through the um, neurotic area we passed, we've entered the trachea and I'm sure all of you can make out the diagnosis what it is. <clears throat> so we can see that just in the middle of the trachea or just above the carina, there is this uh, white structure which is a foreign body and that was the reason why this child was having chronic wet cough lingering for so long. So this child Raju had um, So he had a foreign body as the cause, which was then retrieved. Now, coming to cough variant asthma, just a few words on this because it's a very controversial topic whether it really exists in children or not. And as per the literature by most of the, the consensus seems to be that isolated cough in children without any wheezing or uh, signs of atopy or breathlessness, it does not always represent asthma. Okay, so it's a form of the entity that is more commonly observed in adults than in children. And uh, they have provided a diagnostic criteria for what is cough variant asthma, uh, which is isolated chronic cough, uh, more nocturnal. There is no bronchodilator reversibility on the spirometry. 
but the methacholine test uh, uh, methacholine challenge test is positive which indicates airway hypo hyper responsiveness and they show good response to anti asthma treatment but the ers because we see quite a few children uh, who do come with isolated you know this cough uh, that is going on and it is recurrent also so they have come out with uh, uh, this uh, a particular plan that they uh, advocate for children with chronic dry cough whether anti asthma medications should be given to them or not so if we really feel that this looks to be you know a cough that could have an allergic uh, component uh, to it we can give a short trial of inhaled steroids for 1 to 2 months but if there is no response just stop and here what i want to emphasize is they advocate inhaled steroids and not systemic steroids and there is no evidence for um, uh, anti leukotrienes uh, as a uh, uh, pharmacotherapy for cough variant asthma and we all know that now fdi has given a red flag a red box warning that it is montelukast is associated with many neuropsychiatric um, and uh, neurological abnormalities in children in about 10% of the children so that was essentially about the dry cough now we come to the wet cough so wet cough does it does have many many more differential diagnoses than you know uh, the dry cough so it is far more sinister than uh, dry cough so some of the entities for wet cough are tuberculosis protracted bacterial bronchitis uh, mist foreign body and we all know that the history of uh, choking is uh, present only in about 30% cases of foreign body aspiration and chronic aspiration which could be seen in children with neurodevelopmental problems or those who have airway anomalies like tracheoesophageal fistulas h type and for this uh, we can diagnose this on bronchoscopy or uh, there are these newer modalities that uh, we can put a dye like uh, methacholine uh, the methyl uh, 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 this thing uh, um methylene uh, we could put during the bronchoscopy and this we can see during endoscopy the aspiration that is taking place uh cystic fibrosis primary ciliary dyskinesia and immune deficiency are the other entities that we must uh, seek pointers for these and then bronchi cases and bronchiolitis obliterans most commonly in our country we would be seeing post infectious but even post uh, transplant lung transplant uh, or um, Uh, stem cell transplant bronchiolitis obliterans is also seen so uh, we would be coming to uh, this uh, uh, this study that was done where uh, they found out what were the major causes for uh, chronic wet cough and they found that uh, most of the causes were either due to protracted bacterial bron uh, bronchitis which was seen in 41% or asthma bronchitis and tracheomalacia and in many children it, there was actually no cause that was found it just resolved without any specific diagnosis so this is a multi center study that uh, was done now uh, i think many of us perhaps have heard of protracted bacterial bronchitis but for some it could be a new word yes it is not a very old entity it came into vogue um as late as 2006 uh, when it was first published in chest the origin of this word actually goes back to australian um, um researcher and pulmonologist uh, dr ab chang who has described to this entity first in australia in their indigenous children so what really is protracted bacterial bronchitis is basically a chronic kind of bronchitis that is seen and children have chronic wet cough but they don't have any other uh, you know systemic symptoms or uh, problems elsewhere in the body with normal growth and development and they are essentially well appearing and examination wise the only sign that can sometimes be present is a rattly chest and x-ray may show some little bit of peribronchial changes but is essentially normal and so is the spirometry so uh, in australia the prevalence of protracted bacterial bronchitis in referral hospitals pulmonology referral hospitals is seen in almost 10 to 40% children so now they have devised a 
um, a diagnostic criteria. I need to put this down. So, um, uh, which was published uh, in European Respiratory Journal in 2017. The current criteria is essentially a clinical criteria where there should be continuous chronic cough, wet for more than two weeks, four, four weeks, no other sign and symptoms with no specific uh, cough pointers or red flag signs should be present. And what is important is that this cough should resolve after two week course of antibiotics. Now, this is important because many of us do give antibiotics to these children who come with, you know, uh, what we label as chronic bronchitis, but then we just give uh, maybe five days or seven days of antibiotics. So what uh, they advocate is that, um, you know, two weeks. And why this entity is important is because they have found that this may be later on leading to uh, bronchitis. So this lingering infection can cause that. Previously, microbiological uh, uh, diagnosis on bowel or sputum was required, but now it is no longer uh, required to fulfill the diagnostic uh, definition of PVD. Okay, the commonest organisms that they have found is H influenza, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Moraxella, and Staph aureus, which are the usual, you know, respiratory tract infection that are seen as colonizers in upper or the lower airway. And as I said, the treatment would be um, oral uh, amoxiclav for two weeks in the standard doses. So um, let us look at a few other cases to break the monotony now. Um, this is a 10 month old boy who has a recurrent and persistent cough. Just a second. Huh. And uh, um, uh, this cough is associated with noisy breathing for the last uh, uh, one month. And he has had already two hospital admissions for this. And a very important history we should always ask the parents is, bacha, thik hai, do pneumonia hoti hai, but kya beej mein bacha bilkul thik ho jata hai? Or there is an interval symptoms that continue to linger. So this child had never been asymptomatic. And the feeding history, it revealed that his noisy breathing increased and uh, during the feeding sessions. And he used to detach from the breast. He used to get you know, tired during these feeding sessions. And he also had failure to thrive uh, with tachypnea and retractions on examination and both wheezing and rattly chest and crepitations was present. Okay. So what would be uh, the differential diagnosis for this kind of a child? Of course, we all know that because there is feeding related uh, exacerbations, one is chronic aspirations, which could be related to airway uh, anomalies or uh, uh, there is no vomiting. So we will not think of re um, gastroesophageal reflux. And of course, because it's a wet cough and in the diagnostic um, uh, list, uh, the other possibilities are immune deficiency, cystic fibrosis or primary cellular dyskinesia. Uh, but in primary cellular dyskinesia, a child would have a lot of nasal symptoms also along with the you know resp uh, the lower respiratory symptoms so this was the x-ray at uh, two months of age and this is the x-ray at five months of age uh, which is you know not really telling me that there is a very significant abnormality that i can really pick up and this x-ray at 10 months of age definitely shows a lot of uh, uh, infiltrates uh, in the central uh, part of the lung feet. So, of course, you know, suspecting that there is something underlying because of so many red flag signs, we did a bronchoscopy. And then let's see what the bronchoscopy would reveal. So we entered the trachea and if you can see, so here the anterior and the anterior wall of the trachea is almost approximating to the posterior wall. So this is a case of tracheomalacia. And that is why 
the child was not able to coordinate his swallowing and breathing. So that is why there was feeding related. And what we also see is this hole that is emerging. What this is just about the carina. So this is a tracheoesophageal fistula. So the, the tracheomalacia in this child is actually more of a secondary tracheomalacia. The primary problem is this uh, tracheoesophageal fistula that uh, I, where my pointer is and we can see. Okay. So that child bore had tracheoesophageal fistula. Now let's look at this child who is about eight years old and so he's been having this problem for the last two, three weeks, this hacking noise. This is another problem. So this girl used to do this kind of sound, you know, almost for hours together. Even at midnight also, she used to get up and for two, three hours, you know, parents were like so much in distress that what is really happening. So we all know what these entities are basically. They are, so they are basically habit cough. What uh, was previously described as habit cough, now it is called as the somatic cough or respiratory somatization, but that is, there is some irritate, irritant that hits the throat and that incites coughing, but then it becomes a vicious cycle, you know? So uh, this is what uh, uh, somatic cough is. So um, this is another case. So this case uh, was diagnosed when I was doing my fellowship at uh, uh, BC Children's Hospital, Vancouver. Uh, where I did my uh, pediatric pulmonology fe uh, fellowship. A very interesting case, 10 year old boy who was recently diagnosed with mycoplasma pneumonia and was well treated with azithromycin. Um, he was hospitalized and required oxygen, but then he continued to have wet cough. And three weeks later, he started having progressive shortness of breath on walking, but uh, the general physician, the GPs over there, were not able to auscultate any adventitious sounds. And the child was treated with bronchodilators, antibiotics, steroids, but he was not really showing much response. And he was readmitted after two months and had bilateral preps and easing with the desaturation. And uh, he was started on the asthma protocol and oxygen was provided, but he worsened. He was shifted to the PICU where BiPAP was started. And then it was weaned over after two days. His cultures were negative, immune workup, echo, mycoplasma, everything was negative. But if you look at his X-ray, we can see bilateral hyperinflation. So uh, they went for a CT scan. And over there, you know, the protocol is that in, in hyperinflation, for in most of the children, they do uh, inspiratory and expiratory films. So we can see, you know, a lot of dark areas on the inspiratory film, which indicates there is hyperinflation uh, because of the ear trapping. But the best way to identify ear trapping is expiration. Expiration mein lung khali ho jana chahiye. But here we can see the blackness is still persisting, which indicates that the uh, there is ear trapping that is happening. Uh, so, and also the CT was able to pick up these bronchiectetic changes. So this child suffered from post-infectious bronchiolitis obliterans, secondary to mycoplasma pneumonia. So sometimes, you know, such uh, um, complicated co uh, type of complications can also occur following a very, uh, you know, a simple organism which we consider. So this child was provided um, oxygen. He was given pulse IV methyl prednisone and uh, then subsequently shifted to oral prednisone. Uh, he was also started on inhaled steroids. But even after discharge, if you look at his FEV1, you know, which is pretty uh, low. So anything above 80% FEV1 is considered as uh, normal. But here, you know, he continued in spite of the third pulse his FEV1 was still low and the FEV1 by FPC 
was also reduced, indicating that he was going towards a restrictive uh, lung, uh, lung disease was also present along with obstructive nature. So um, this child uh, also you know, had low saturations uh, even after uh, the second pulse. So subsequently, this child was put in the lung uh, transplantation program and was referred to, to sick kids. So he also had a high TLC. I, I don't want to go into the nuances of spirometry here because um, it will be too much uh, for this session. Um, so when should we suspect host infectious view? I think that's uh, the message I would like to give. Um, if there is persistent symptom or signs, you know, after any um, LRTI in the form of wheezing, crackles, or uh, desaturations or dyspnea. X-ray changes may sometimes be normal, and uh, we can do a CT scan, which would indicate mosaic attenuation and ear trapping, and sometimes even bronchitis. Lung biopsy nowadays is not considered mandatory based on the CT findings and spirometry in older children, which depicts obstructive airflow defect. Um, that is good enough to initiate therapy. And uh, treatment requires systemic steroids. So now, uh, uh, in the end, I would just like to, uh, so do I have time? Okay, I think I'm almost exceeding uh, my time. So this is the- uh, We can uh, take five more minutes, Dr. Mandip. Acha, okay, sir. I would be finishing in five minutes. Uh, so let's understand uh, this flow chart. So a child comes with chronic cough for more than four weeks. We need to take a detailed history, look at any red flags, do an X-ray and spirometry. If there are specific cough pointers, investigate accordingly and then treat according to the diagnosis. If there are no specific cough pointers, then classify whether it is wet cough or dry cough. Now, if there is a you know, dry cough, but no pointers, no red flags, just check for irritants, indoor irritants like smoke or uh, biomass fuels and uh, uh, rule out any of the preceding infections that the child could have had in the last few weeks. Okay. Um, just follow up this child for about four weeks, a month, and see if there is a spontaneous regression that is happening and or it is persisting. So if the child is having a persistent dry cough, even after a month, then a trial of inhaled steroids is advocated. For example, you just 200 to 400 microgram only for about four to eight weeks. And if the child resolves, just stop inhaled steroids and follow up for recurrence. If on stopping the child has recurrence, then the child needs to be uh, treated uh, again with inhaled steroids and then perhaps we need to um, you know, investigate this child for uh, probable uh, atopic uh, nature of this cough or asthma. Now, if it is persisting, again, we need to investigate for underlying causes. So what are those uh, uh, we have already seen the end, uh, causes. Now, if it is a wet cough, of course, tuberculosis workup has to be initiated in our country. Um, after investigating for tuberculosis, if the answer is nil, we can treat these children for antibiotics for two weeks, the amoxiclav, as for protracted bacterial bronchitis. If the cough resolves after two weeks, then this is a, a retrospective diagnosis of PVD. But if it is persistent, then again, because it's a red flag, then uh, we need to investigate for underlying cause. So, uh, so this is essentially, you know, the um, treatment, uh, the flow chart that is uh, provided. <laughs> Is there anyone who can take the control and see if I can? I think I'm almost reached the end of my just to take home message would be there. Yeah. 
So what are the take home messages? Chronic cough is more than four weeks. We need to assess for red flag signs. And isolated cough is typically not asthma. Chronic wet cough, but no specific cough pointers are there. We can give a trial of oral antibiotics for a possibility of protracted bacterial bronchitis. But if cough pointers are present, we need to further investigate for the underlying cause. So I think I am well in time. <laughs> Thank you so much for your patient Thank hearing. You. And, Thank uh, you, Dr. Vandeep. That was an excellent, uh, very practical, practice-oriented approach. And uh, just a small uh, query, how much actually you see the prevalence of different causes? Like uh, post-URI cuff is how common, uh, AR cuff is how common, asthma cuff, TB cuff, in your own practice, rather than in okay. studies what we quote. Okay. So I think the, the most common cause being any ambulatory setting, uh, you know, in our clinic setting. Dr. Mandip, need... you can stop sharing your screen. Okay, Acha. Uh, okay. So, take a second. Pause, share. Stop, share. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Hanji. So, uh, so, in ambulatory settings where there is no referral bias, the most common cause for chronic cough would be post infectious cough after viral fever, uh, you know, URIs that we see. So that can sometimes last, you know, from two weeks to four weeks. But this would, this type of cough would initially may be wet, but gradually tends to get a dry type of cough. And it is in no way really hampering the daily activities of the child. In fact, the parents, it is the anxiety of the parents that is, you know, bringing the child to the clinic rather than you know, the, the child uh, per, himself per se. Um, as far as, you know, protracted bacterial bronchitis is concerned, mm, this is a new entity and, you know, uh, our, our eyes see what the mind knows. So if we start looking for it, uh, we do come across some children who continue to have this, uh, you know, the phlegmy nature of the core. Um, since I started private practice, um, uh, you know, from 2019 onwards, I have treated two children like this. Um, and um, their past history was uh, so, you know, that, so that makes it a very small number if to very a small, yeah, just, clinic just, only two patients huh. so uh, but you know again if if you sit in a uh, hospital based setting where you know more severe versions of children will come and you know they are referred so there the spectrum will be a little different but we do see congenital anomalies you know uh, that uh, that of course is there you know strider we do see. So red flag signs are definitely seen in, uh, you know, even the clinic setting. We do have children coming with stridal where uh, feeding history is hardly taken. And I was able to diagnose, you know, valvular cyst in two of those children who had seen five pediatricians each. Um, but nobody was taking the feeding history, you know, which the mother was able to even point out. So uh, that's uh, you know some uh, some of the uh, you know learning points uh, from such cases. There is a question by Dr. Raj Mehta, Dr. Mandeep, cuff variant asthma. Why no reversibility to bronchodilator? So uh, that is because you know uh, it is still something you know which is uh, not very well understood. It is more of a disease of the adults. And uh, typically, the asthma is a disease which is involving the middle order and the small airways, right? But the cough variant asthma would be, you know, something like uh, more of the upper, uh, uh, you know, part of the lower respiratory tract. So that is why they don't really see the reversibility. And uh, uh, so that is how it is described. And I think in children, we hardly, uh, you know, do a spirometry because uh, age is like only above six or seven years, you know, that we can actually do spirometry. So, uh, I think we'll have more questions. Uh, next topic is relevant to that only. We have a topic on investigation and diagnosis in asthma by Dr. Shalini Tyagi only. Before we end this thing, Dr. Ajay is present. Dr. Ajay, any comments? It was a wonderful talk and very useful for all the private practitioners. So, please continue. 
thank you thank you thank you so thank you dr mandeep it was an excellent talk and uh, definitely that will elaborate further all the causes the cuff pointers and all this this was a really good talk thanks for your time dr mandeep so uh, friends now we move on to our uh, next topic that is diagnosis and investigations in pediatric asthma and we have a very good academician a pediatric respiratory expert on this dr shalini tyagi who is uh, head of the department pediatric department metro hospital and is also a european diplomat in pediatric pulmonology and we welcome dr shalini uh, thank you dr manish yes uh, should i be sharing my screen now yes dr shalini yes thank you dr mandeep it was a you know the crisp take home messages were actually very good two comments on that one the persistent bacterial bronchitis in our practice is a bit more we get to see a lot more of them and the second and the other thing which i'm going to vehemently oppose is the fact that the spirometry cannot be done in smaller children so that is what my entire talk is about today <laughs> right i will just take a second here okay so my um okay let me just start from here okay so i'm going to talk about um investigation diagnosis and investigations in pediatric asthma now asthma is not something which is new it has been diagnosed for so many years uh, you know by our senior pediatricians as well however it continues to remain a debate and a very important talk to be discussed in every pediatric forum it simply means that there are so many lacunas in the diagnosis there are so many lacunas in the treatment i'll be going uh, to, uh, with the diagnostic part of it so uh, in spite of all the definitions that we have heard we've read for over a period of time the asthma is heterogeneous so my asthma can be different from another person's asthma so both the symptoms and pathology differ from person to person the underlying chronic airway inflammation and the classical symptoms of episodic cough chest tightness fast breathing wheezing always persist and the person is normal in between it could be excess there to be exacerbating pointers as well and we it's imperative for us to document a expiratory air flow limitation to document that the airways go in an obstruction mode and which is reversible now from the gina it uh, uh, clearly mentions that places where spirometry was not done as a routine diagnosis for asthma 50% of the people are under diagnosed and not treated the way they would have to be in children the case is otherwise there's so many other things which mimic asthma and which are there are many children who are on treatment on asthma wherein they were suffering from a different disease so looking at this child this child was being treated for asthma for a very long time however what she had was a foreign body in her airways this child had admissions for asthma wherein the reason was a vocal cord dysfunction which could have been easily picked up by a simple spirometry asthma who which go on uncontrolled may have some underlying associated comorbidities uh, as in or complication as in allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis which corrected on time can prevent a significant uh, morbidity so let's look at what the guidelines have to say about investigations of asthma so the main stay will continue to remain history however once you have a person whose symptoms are typical of asthma go deep in the history look for family history of atopy look for personal atopy uh, watch rule out other things which you know which uh, rule uh, you know which are against asthma as detailed in dr mandeep's talk the wet cough the failure to thrive so it has to be not asthma things are always ruled out then if the person is sick what we require is an immediate treatment however it is it's important to diagnose on the very outset before we start them on a preventive treatment by a spirometry if the spirometry cannot be performed or if it is normal we can resort to other tests like peak flow meter but documentation of bronchial obstruction is important 
let's look at these nice guidelines these are for the children who have symptoms suggestive of asthma between the age group of 5 and 16 they moved beyond spirometry and they've added pheno now what is pheno pheno is nitric oxide levels of the exhaled air which is uh, elevated in eosinophilic lung inflammation so pheno high pheno is used along with the spirometry and peak flow meter uh, readings for diagnosis of asthma let's look at the japanese guidelines in children apart from history taking spirometry um, inflammations that is pheno they've added documentation of atopy whether it is blood examination or skin prick test because in pediatrics it is predominantly atopic asthma which troubles so whenever we are planning to put uh, to label a child or or whenever we are planning to give them a long term treatment it is imperative to document that the child has asthma so to diagnose we have two kind of tests the first test is to demonstrate that the child has airway obstruction which is also reversible either by self or on bronchodilatation and to look at the inflammation whether there is a presence of eosinophilic inflammations or atopic manifestations to, um, for the mechanical uh, diagnosis we have spirometry impulse oscillometry and peak flow meters for pathophysiology we have serum ige specific ige skin prick test sputum eosinophils serum eosinophils and the pheno as well let's look at the use of this now this is the typical hager body box system which we use in our um, adult asthma diagnosis so this is the uh, um, spirometry being done for an adult however we also use incentive spirometry in our children so uh, when you know the children are given a target something like to blow a balloon so if i give him a target to blow a balloon he will uh, you know it becomes easier for him to achieve a good expiratory time which is required for a proper flow volume loop so this child was asked to blow the balloon so that it burst and you can see to by incentivizing it we have been you able to use spirometry in younger children as young as 4 is something that i can boast from my center the similar thing on a simple vitalograph in the clinic using incentivization we can uh, uh, we can use this as well and do a spirometry here in the incentive is given is blowing up the balloons and by doing so we've been able to do a good uh, spirometer graph been able to achieve so what we need is a good patient technician a child friendly technician and it can be done in younger children as well and documenting actually helps let's look at the principle the simple principle is whenever the air comes out of the lung there is certain amount of air which is going to come over a certain period of time so maximum amount of air usually is released in the first second and that's the common look of the um volume time graph that we see now if the airway is obstructed the air that is going to okay that is the normal graph that is it's made uh, maximum amount of air uh, the total amount of air that is released is post vital capacity now this air the first second maximum amount is out which we call fev1 usually in adults it takes around 5 to 6 seconds for the lung to get emptied in children it usually take around 3 to 4 seconds uh, as we can see from the graph the most amount of the air is out in the first um, second and the ratio of fev1 and fvc in adults is more than 80 percent in children it is more than 90 percent and maximum around amount of air is released now let's look at the obstructed airway so when the airway will get, be obstructed the air that will be released is going to be slow the amount of air that is coming out in the first second is less and there is tenting of the graph so <clears throat> this is how a volume time graph will look in an obstructed airway so if we see here the amount of air that is coming out in the first second is definitely reduced and it is taking longer for the lungs to lungs to get emptied the ratio of fev1 
upon FVC is definitely reduced and it takes longer than three seconds to empty in an adult. So look at the flow volume time graph in an obstructed airway. The white line is the normal airway. And as the obstruction increases, the blunting of the airways uh, start happening to the extent that in severe obstruction, the entire volume might not be released. There is air trapping and the force vital capacity is not even achieved. The other graph that we see is the flow volume loop. So uh, we plot flow against the volume of the lung. So the child is asked to fill up the lung to total lung capacities and then blow out of the lung. So if we see this is expiratory loop, the first part, the flow is very fast. Why would the flow be high in the first part? Because larger volume of air from the trachea and bronchi coming from the larger airways is coming. And this is the peak flow rate, which is achieved. The later part of the flow, which this, um, the descending link of the expiratory loop, this is the air coming from the smaller airways. This is the part which gets affected in asthma. This is where the obstruction happens. And this is the flow which will be reduced initially in any asthmatic child. So the flow of the air, when the lung volume is around 50% is known as FEF50. Similarly, FEF75 and 25. This FEF25 on 75, so flow of air when the lung volume reduces from 75 to 25% is known as FEF 2575. And this is the most sensitive part which gets affected during an airway obstruction. An inspiratory loop should always be completed to ensure that lung is at the total lung capacity whenever we are trying to start a uh, maneuver. As, uh, how does the uh, flow volume loop look in an obstructed airway? The first thing that is going to affect is FEF 2575 and scalloping is going to begin. More severe obstruction, more severe scalloping. And as we can see, the entire air is not expelled and there is some air trapping happening as well. And even FEC post vital capacity will be reduced in uh, significant obstructions. So what are the parameters we are seeing? The forced vital capacity, FEV1, FEV1 upon FEC, and uh, peak flow rate can also be studied. FEF 2575 can be studied. The first thing that we see is the ratio of FEV1 upon FEC. If it is more than 90%, then we look at the FEC. If it is more than 80%, this is a normal lung, neither obstructive nor restrictive. But if the FEC is reduced with normal FEV1 upon FEC, this is restrictive lung disease. These are the chronic lung disease Dr. Mandeep have been talking about. Now, when the ratio is reduced with the normal FEC, this is classical asthma that we see in our clinics, mild to moderate obstructive airway disease. However, if the FEC is reduced, the probability is either it is severe obstruction or there is an obstruction with underlying uh, um, parenchymal lung disease happening. The other thing that we see is um, reversal of the airway obstruction after giving the bronchodilator. So if the reversibility is more than 12% in FEC or 200 ml absolute value, we'll call it reversible airway obstruction. So we look at the airflow limitation, we look at the bronchodilator reversibility, also, we can look at the variation in lung function between different visits. So four weeks apart, in case the FEV1 is uh, changed to more than 12%, is also taken as an obstruction. Troubleshooting, anybody who's doing a spirometry should be aware whether the graph is good enough for us to interpret or there has been, the child has been coughing and the maneuver is not um, adequate enough for us to uh, compensate, to comment upon, and it should be repeated once the child is better. So these are the real-time graphs that we see. Let's look at the graph first. Now, the black line is something we wanted the child to achieve based on his age, height, ethnicity. Look at this graph. The peak flow rate is definitely reduced. There is scalloping of the FEF2575 and FVC is not achieved. 
after bronchodilatation, there is definitely an improvement. It's still, still not reaching what the right should have been. The uh, volume time graph is definitely blunted and on bronchodilation, it becomes a bit better, but the way we wanted it to the normal one, it's definitely not there. Then now let's start looking at the FVC. The predicted FVC is coming 82% is then more than 80%. So we're okay with it. If I look at the FEV1, it is 77%. It is definitely less. And on bronchodilator, there is 17% variability. To uh, document asthma, we needed 12%. Let's look at effort independent criteria. You know, if the child did not perform well, then both the parameters FEV1 and FEC get affected. So this is effort independent criteria. It should have been more than 90, it is 79. So this child definitely has an airway obstruction with, um, with etiquette bronchodilatation uh, uh, effect. Now, please look here, the age is five years. So yes, we can perform tests in children as young as five years, even in the severe scalloping of the graph, the child is severely obstructed here with probably a restrictive disease or probably a severe airway obstruction. Look at the blunting of the volume time graph here. The age here is five years, we can do that. This one is another five-year-old child and now you'll be able to appreciate Look at the graph, look at the reversibility, look at the 30% reversibility. This child is responding so well to bronchodilatation. It could be, he could be in uh, acute attack. So we can run spirometry in all children. All that we need is one incentive spirometry, time, patience. Having said that, is spirometry the gold standard world over completely uh, enough? No, it has limitations. Apart from the simple fact that not all children can perform, there are other limitations. Limitations like uh, children, the maximum amount of air is expelled way before uh, the FEV1. The, he might, the children might completely expel the air in FE 0.5, you know, less than a second's time. And the uh, pliability of the chest wall, there's so many other factors which affect the um, FEV1 as well. And so that what does it mean? It means that it is showing us the condition of the larger airways. The smaller airways wherein the condition lies, wherein the asthma lies is sometimes missed. So we needed another test to know what's happening. To our rescue, this test uh, impulse oscillometry has been introduced. How does an impulse oscillometry work? It works on a simple principle that it has a loudspeaker. It is an attached arm to our already existing spirometry. There's a uh, loudspeaker which is going to emit sound waves of different uh, frequencies. These sound waves are uh, interspersed on the tidal breathing. So normal breathing, the sound waves will go inside. Uh, sound waves with smaller wavelength will reach the end of the lung. So they'll tell you a condition of the entire lung. And the larger airways, sound, sound waves with bigger wavelength will tell you the condition of the larger lung. So different wavelengths of sound waves are going into the lung, which are superimposed on the tidal breathing. And once they get reflected back, they are... Uh, um, gauged by the software in the system and by the difference in the wavelength, the resistance concurred is measured, a simple technique. Now, this is what the spirometry is. It is an extended arm to the Hager body box system that we have. And if you look here, the, uh, it's all that the child has to do is put this disposable mouthpiece into the mouth, hold the cheek, squeeze the nose and just take a normal breathing. There's nothing else that needs to be done. So by impulse oscillometry, we've been able to do in children as young as four years when they were not able to perform a spirometry. So a simple procedure to be done. Let's see how do we interpret here. So we look at two things. One is resistance, second is reactance. What is resistance? Resistance is the energy which is required to push the air um, sound wave in the forward manner into the airway. Reactance is the recoil that is generated by the lung tissue. So reactance is usually negative. 
So these are the five parameters that we check. This is the resistance graph. Now, these are different wavelengths of sound waves that are going inside. As I told you, that larger wavelength sound waves will go to the central airways. They'll give us the condition of the central airways. Smaller wavelength sound waves are going to give us condition of the entire lung systems. This is an obstructed lung. Usually R5 and R20 are in one line. They're almost normal. So this is uh, the resistance. Reactance. Reactance is the tissue recoil. It's always in the negative. 0.4 is what we call normal. The reactance, when it becomes a zero, which when it turns to positive, the frequency at which it happens is known as resonant frequency. Here it is coming around 25 to 27. And the triangle that is made is known as area of reactance or Goldman triangle. So we look at, when we interpret, we look at total, resist, uh, total resistance, central resistance. Total minus central, it gives you the small airway resistance, a very, very sensitive parameter. Reactance becomes more negative in obstructive airway disease. So does the frequency will increase and area under the curve will increase. So this is how a normal graph would look like an obstructed graph R5 minus R20 has increased. The resistance per se has increased more so in the peripheral airways. Reactance has become more negative. The area increases. So these are the normal graphs and abnormal graphs with practice we, uh, let, we come to know. And we can always grade the severity of resistance by as mild, moderate, or severe based on the readings. The bronchodilator reversibility can also be documented when you give a bronchodilator and run the readings. Look at this graph again. Now, uh, uh, this is the real time R patients. If you can see the R5 is much more than the R20, there is definitely a dip. And on bronchodilator, the line can, becomes a bit straighter. So there is a definite improvement on bronchodilator. The reactance pre-bronchodilator is bigger. The frequency is here and on bronchodilator, the reactors is moving towards positive, the frequency becoming better and area, uh, the triangle is also becoming better. Look at the graph here. These are the triangles of central airway and peripheral airway resistance. In a normal graph, both of them should be almost equal. This is bigger size. So this child has small airway obstruction. Look at the absolute value. R5 more than 150 is we call small airway obstruction with a reversibility of 25%. So there is a definite uh, reversibility, airway obstruction, which has reversibility. There are certain other parameters. Frequency is increased. The area is increased. The D5 minus D20 is increased. So either one of them has to be positive. Look at this child, I showed you severe scalloping. The look at the impulse oscillometry, look at the airway resistance he has and no reversibility even on bronchodilator. A beautiful graph showing uh, airway obstruction, which is not reversed on bronchodilatation. Uh, similarly, the more cases that we see, the more readings that we see, we can assess obstruction. So why is this beautiful test not being used as a standard test? Because as of now, the values are not there uh, world over to be included into the guidelines. So they will gradually, I'm sure it is the test of the future, but as of now, it is an add-on test or test which we can do. The peak flow meter, our humble peak flow meter, the thermometer of asthma is something we can do in all our OPD practice, though it's effort dependent, we can diagnose, we can monitor, we can look at the treatment. It is portable, it can be used at bedside. Give them the peak flow charts, teach them how to uh, uh, take the readings thrice in the morning, thrice in the evening, take the best of the reading, plot it, clean it, uh, prevent fungal infections, do not use in between patients. Now I've put in this case, this was a 12 year old girl with us with classical symptoms of asthma, but uh, as you can see, the spirometry is completely normal. And this child, because she had so many symptoms, this is what we had given her. She made a rough chart at home and we can clearly document the PEFR variability, which we can calculate as well. Small, um, uh, some words on pheno. Pheno is nitric oxide level of the ex uh, exhaled air. 
Gina says that high pheno after four weeks of a respiratory infection can be diagnosed as asthma in children less than five years of age. Pheno can be taken as additional parameter. However, and pheno, uh, normal pheno in a uh, child, otherwise asthmatic child, spirometry proven asthmatic child should not deter us from not using a steroid. What is pheno? Pheno is simple, a pro-inflammatory mediator. It is a quantitative measure to measure nitric oxide, which is produced by nitric oxide synthetase. Nitric oxide synthetase is increased whenever there is an eosinophilic airway inflammation. So it is an indirect marker of airway inflammation. This is the pheno that we do. All that we need is a patient a technician who explains in detail everything about what he has to do. So this child is being explained. There is a disposable mouthpiece as well. All that he has to do is hold the mouthpiece and hold the breath for a certain while. Now we can also incentivize this. In this, we can see the child is going to hold it uh, for certain seconds. And that's the entire test. So it literally is a child's play. Um, there are many types of pheno machines available. This is the standard one. And uh, it uh, does require calibration in between and disposable uh, mouthpieces. The child has to maintain between the green lines. So once he maintains between the green lines for about five seconds, the test is done. That's all. And we have a report. So use pheno for diagnosis. Whenever there is a eosinophilic inflammation, these are the children who are going to respond well to corticosteroid. So pheno you, helps a lot to uh, determine corticoid responsive, corticosteroid responsiveness. And to see whether the person has been taking or not taking a pheno would definitely tell us whether the person has been on medicines. The test, the magic numbers that we need to remember in children is 20 and 30. If it is less than 20 parts per billion, it is unlikely to have eosinophilic inflammation. More than 35, it is highly likely to have eosinophilic inflammation. Also, we can look at the response to treatment. If we have given a treatment, look at the repeat pheno after four weeks. If there is an increase in more than 10, then the disease is going uncontrolled. And if it is decreased, it is otherwise. So we can use it during the diagnosis. If the child is symptomatic and high pheno likely to benefit from the in, um, uh, inhaled corticosteroids. These are the four-year-old children I'm talking about in whom maybe the spirometry was not performed and the test was, uh, you know, we needed to give them a steroid trial. This is an additional test which will help us give us a, you know, it will uh, make us more confident in using a steroid in a child as small as that. However, if the pheno is low, especially very low, around four or five, we'll look for other causes like cystic fibrosis and PCDs. And these are not the children who are going to be on, uh, who should be on steroid. In between, treat and see. Now, a child who's already on asthma, uh, who's <coughs> already diagnosed asthma, who is taking his treatment? How does pheno help? Now, if this child is... Uh, and the child is well controlled on treatment and has a high pheno, we would not want to stop his treatment because the inflammation is going on and he will, you know, exacerbate. However, if the child is symptomatic and the pheno is very low, look for alternative diagnosis. Use pheno in the right manner. It will help. It is not associated with neutrophilic inflammation. It is affected by a lot of things like smoking, by infection, by medicines and by age as well. Nasal nitric oxide is the diagnostic test that we run in our center for PCDs and cystic fibrosis, and it has been a good agent. So this is how the pheno report looks like. All that I need to see is this number. Okay, this is more than 35. I need to give steroid. This child is somewhere around 34. Of course, this is going to help. Skin prick test, a word on the allergy test. Now, while the first thing about the allergy test is we need to know which one to test. Somebody who has atopic manifestation, who has multiple allergies like respiratory, skin, nasals are ideal candidates where we can do. However, an urticaria patient might not benefit with an uh, allergy test. Total Ig has limited uh, value because it can be high in parasitic load. It can be falsely low because, you know, the total Ig is made up of multiple uh, specific IgEs. So even if one specific IgE is rise, 
high and the others are low, it will not reflect on the total IgVe levels. However, it is helpful in diagnosis like ABP and whenever we plan our omalizumab. Looking at the cascade of the test, the first continues to remain history. The second would be subcutaneous test and then eat in vitro and then they can be a food challenge test. So why do we need an SPT? Because all said and done, all talks about allergic rhinitis and asthmas are controlling. We do not modify the natural course of the disease. And Gina now agrees that giving the right immunotherapy from the initial age might reduce their steroid requirement, might reduce their uh, exacerbations. I would not call it complete cure, but then it, it is a good adjunct in controlling these asthma diseases. Why is SPT better than the blood test? Because it checks the IgE, which is attached to the mast cell wherein the inflammation happens. The only person where we cannot control is an uncontrolled asthma where we should not do. Otherwise, all rhinitis, all asthmas, we can always run. Skin prick test needs to be done under proper, uh, you know, technique, proper allergens with a good knowledge of cross, um, you know, antigen, uh, there is a cross reactivity between different antigens, the pollen calendar, the seasonal variations and symptoms and everything needs to be interpreted and it should not be interpreted just based on a positive test. It definitely is more effective than more uh, specific and sensitive than the blood test. Here we have run this dust mite. If you can see there are pseudopodias as well. This is histamine, which is the control test. Saline is negative. And this dust mite is way bigger than the histamine test. So this definitely is a <coughs> positive skin test. Here and also this again is the dust mite where it is positive. And these are the children who benefit a lot from the um, immunotherapies as well. In vitro tests are convenient to do when the child is already on a medication and they travel for dis from distances to us. They test, they give us tests for uh, multiple allergens at the same time. However, they are more expensive. Interpretation is difficult because different uh, um, test levels have different, uh, you know, positivity, you know, uh, values. So not every test which is seen as positive on a blood report might be positive and we need to know individual levels as well. When the tests were done in general population, the food specific IgE was positive in 60% of the population, which was cross allergen reactivity with some or other pollen and going ahead and asking them to stop the food is not going to control the symptoms, it's going to be make their miserable life a bit more miserable. The component result diagnostic tests are, are tests of the future, which we'll be doing soon and where this cross reactogenicity problem is going to go away. To summarize my talk, spirometry continues to remain the gold standard. It should be at least attempted in all children in whom asthma is being suspected. Use spirometry not only for diagnosis to maintain the control, run it twice a year, even in the children who are on intermittent treatment as and when treatment. Pheno has a promising role both in diagnosis and calibrating. It is a good adjunct to the treatment. Impulse uh, oscillometry uh, 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 measures the obstruction at small airway obstruction. It is more specific. However, it's too soon to be in the guidelines. SPT is something I would perform in all children who have some kind of atopic manifestation, allergic rhinitis and asthmas for a better control of their diseases. Peak flow meter is most underused device which we can give to our patients, all of us, and we should reserve our specific IgE test and total IgE only for special circumstances. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shalini. I think that was an excellent talk on uh, investigations and diagnosis in asthma. And we also welcome Dr. Pankaj Garg, sir, our secretary-elect to the present conference. Welcome, Dr. Pankaj. Uh, Dr. Shalini, this is interesting currently to discuss because me being more of asthma training module trained guy from IAP, I rely highly on clinical aspects of uh, diagnosis and treatment. And I would share interestingly in last one week, two episodes happened with me. Like today was one patient, multi-trigger wheeze, uh, roughly around two and a half year old child. I started on the, the treatment, but somehow mother was not satisfied. 
she said you have just done not done even x ray blood test any screen pick test <laughs> any test and you have diagnosed and started the treatment how can you be so sure then i tried to convince see i am putting on uh, this uh, therapeutic diagnostic ics we do this and that but she somehow was not satisfied and one patient already since 2 years was on asthma treatment was being weaned off and suddenly he had a exacerbation so i again had to adjust that part last week he came and said sir aapne abhi bhi koi test nahi karaye pehle bhi kuch nahi karaye the so how are you sure you are treating the right thing then the thought came to my mind that somehow they are not satisfied with this thing and you should approach with this investigation probably more frequently uh, can you tell me the current cost of the pheno and oscillometry uh, they are being uh, given that depends doc sir so because i work so we have a subsidized rates so what we call it as a pediatric pulmonary function test profile and we charge 4000 for all three tests the spirometry ios and the pheno i think that's quite reasonable if you see from uh, 4000 rupees test is quite reasonable yes, right? yes but all that one there's a big medical legal issues with the steroids so it's always good to at least write we can always say that the child did not form or you know advise to perform it one month later or when the child is not coughing but it's imperative for us to at least document that it needs to be done that's Very one cool. second we use a lot of videos before we send them for the test you know we give them lot of videos we tell them hum aisa karenge waisa karenge we teach them tumhe 2 ghanta 3 ghanta lagega tiffin leke jao and then all those things have actually worked a lot with us right? actually you need a full team full setup and a good yes. patience and time also now i would invite our uh, other uh, uh, Panelist on the uh, on the CME, Dr. Nin- Mandeep Walia, Dr. Pankaj Gurg. Any comments on this, Dr. Pankaj? Hey, hey, no comments from my side because I don't look after a lot of asthma patients. So I was I'm just a passive listener here. Thank you. Uh, so I think Dr. Shalini, with this, uh, we'll let's see if there any questions or comments are there. Cough variant asthma, it's same. Uh, okay, there is one comment again by Dr. Raj Mehta. The same thing that some patient don't get satisfied with only clinical signs. I think uh, it's better to investigate early than later on uh, turning into a situation where you. uh redraw your diagnosis so with this we conclude this session thank you dr shalini and uh, you have a long work again so you have one more session and for next session i invite our uh, moderator uh, dr somya agarwal dr somya uh, dr somya is medical advisor with uh, gsk vaccines and we uh, she is uh, Uh, basically from uh, kalavati hospital and presently medical advisor at uh, gsk vaccines uh, welcome dr sovya thank you sir uh, good and, evening everyone yeah you can introduce the speaker and talk and then we can start i would like to share my screen yeah i hope my screen is visible yeah it is so uh good evening everyone it is my honor to introduce uh, the speaker for this session uh dr shalini tyagi ma'am and who would uh, require no introduction you would agree so uh, dr shalini tyagi ma'am is uh, uh, the head of the departments at uh, pediatrics metro hospital noida and uh, she is a, a prominent pediatric pulmonologist and a european diplomat in pediatric pulmonology her area of expertise include uh, pediatric pulmonology and allergies and uh, immunology and as well as pediatric care and she has published extensively in this area uh, we have so often heard her on the various national platforms i welcome you ma'am and it would be a pleasure to hear from you yeah thank you samya i will need to share my screen
Okay. Um, is my screen visible to you? No. Not as yet? Just give me a second. Just give me a second. I messed it up with something. Icon must be at the uh, bottom, I think. The green icon share screen at the bottom, bottom of the screen. Yes. Yeah, there. Green icon must be there, share screen. Abhi to kiya tha, Doc, sir. Ho gaya. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes, I think it is here. Okay. Yeah, it's there. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to quickly talk about um, Infanrix Hexa, that is GSK's uh, six uh, valent vaccine. And these are the slides given to me by GSK. And uh, I'm going to speak on them now. So um, the main crux of talking about this topic is we started UIP program long back when we started becoming aware of the vaccination. However, our basic DPT vaccine continues to remain a challenge with different type of WP, AP, two component, three component, and more and more literature has come and confused more rather than giving clear cut messages. So now that we know that all that we need to is give vaccine. Vaccinate has become more important thing rather than the debates. So I'm going to put in forward the scientific basis of Infanrix Hexa. So it has been promoted as the vaccine with three C's, the confidence, convenience, and comfort. And I would want to add another C to it that is cost. So we as pediatrician in general practice, we are aware of the cost when we speak it out in our to our patients. So uh, let's look at the basic vaccines, um, the basic components, the six component of the vaccine. So DPT, the diphtheria vaccine, which we have been giving for more than 50 years, it should have been vanished for now. But unfortunately, we still contribute to more than 50% of the world's diphtheria cases still. And so either we are not vaccinating completely or the vaccine is not giving adequate protection, which is a bit unlikely. So let's look at the reason why we are not still being able to give all of us, all our children, the protection against this bad menace. The other thing is tetanus. All, all of us pediatricians, we've seen a child dying of tetanus is the most painful death any child would have, which could have been prevented by a simple shot. And it's still, India still contributing to uh, almost 50%, 40% of the tetanus globally. It also includes the neonatal tetanus. And I am ashamed to accept this fact at the same time. Pertussis. Pertussis, the, you know, when you call it that weak boy of the class, you know, chisko thoda extra padhana padta hai. We need a lot of mehnat with this kind of a boy in the class. That is what our pertussis is. It uh, seldom get 100% uh, coverage by any of the vaccine. Apart from that, epidemiology has changed. Once we started vaccinating our younger ones, there was resurgence in the adolescent age group. And it continues to remain a big challenge to be corrected. Polio. We, I know I am one of the proud generation who can say that we were part of the pulse polio programs and we were able to eradicate polio from our country. You know, we've moved on from that pulse polio campaigns to polio limited country to polio eradicate, controlled country to eradicated country. So this is one of the feats that we can boast of. However, the menace, the cloud of uh, polio coming back is still looming large on us because our neighboring countries still have the cases. Some of them are wild, some of them are vaccine derived, but it continues to remain a problem. And what happened with the polio was, we had many switches that happened from uh, trivalent oral polio to bivalent oral polio, adding an injectable polio. And somehow the information that should have been percolated to every 
you know, journal pediatrician or to every uh, person who was vaccinated was lost somewhere and proper implementation of injectable polio, which was imperative to control, was not achieved. This is something we discuss again in the talk. Hib was, um, you know, one very um, important cause of meningitis and ear infections and pneumonias has been largely controlled after vaccinations and after hip control, pneumococcus diseases, pneumococcus bacteria has become more important uh, pathogen for respiratory infections since this menace was being controlled. Hepatitis B. Hepatitis B, if you know the carrier state, the problem of early infection and becoming a carrier, hence leading to chronic liver disease, cirrhosis, continues to remain a big problem even uh, now in our country. And India has painfully boasted to have 40 million, 40 million carriers as of now, and many of them die because of hepatitis B still, in spite of having such a wonderful vaccine against the hepatitis B. Now, why was uh, why is important to give hexavalent combination beyond pentavalent? So beyond pentavalent, um, so, uh, there are two pentavalent vaccines available in the market. One is um, having DPT, HIV, and hepatitis B. This is going to miss the polio injection. And the other one, which has DPT, HIV, and IPV, is going to miss a hip infection um, uh, vaccination. So we will have to administer another shot for this vaccination. For all of us who are sitting in a clinic and giving vaccines to our children, there are three things that happen when a parent enters with a child. The parent wants to give you as less vaccine injections as possible. He doesn't want the pain of the shot as, you know, please don't give me a vaccine which causes a lot of pain and fever. And he wants to spend as less as possible. You know, these are the three things that any parent would want once they enter. Herein comes our concept of hexavalent vaccine. Now, from the doctor's point of view, many of us are forced to give in to the parents' demand, and sometimes we reduce the number of brick, and which is commonly done at various places, was replacing the injectable polio by oral polio to reduce the number of brick. And this was the biggest mistake anybody could have done because the polio vaccine oral will have after 2016 will have only protection against P1 and P3 virus, no protection against P2. And the danger of P2 coming back as a, um, as a epidemic increases once we do that. So from the doctor's point of view, the missing infection, missing an educate control against polio vaccination, missing an educate control against hepatitis B, both of the diseases are menacing diseases. Uh, looms large with pentavalent vaccine. Therein comes the role of the hexavalent vaccine. And there was a time when hexavalent vaccine were way costlier than the pentavalent vaccines or the hexavalent acellular were more costly than the WP vaccines, not anymore. And the combinations available are, you know, something which, which have become parent pocket friendly at the same time. So this slide has been taken from pool data from various studies which compared the side effect profile between WP and AP vaccine. This also has the WHO data. If we can see these are the numbers, I, I plan to take this print out and put it on my uh, clinic outside before debating because people asking me 100 questions because this is an evidence base that we can easily speak. 17% reduction in screaming episode, four times lesser hyper-responsive hypotonic episodes, less uh, fever, probable encephalopathy risk has not been documented. I refuse that now no vaccine can have anaphylaxis. I will keep my uh, guards on and be prepared for any anaphylaxis, even if it is WP or acellular, but this is what the data says from various studies across the world. Um, okay, now coming to the pertussis protection per se. For pertussis, we do not have a correlate of protection. So there is no uh, level of antibody title which is given by WHO that will say that if these antibiotics are reached, the vaccine is protective. So how do we know whether the vaccine is working good or not? So for any vaccine to work, we need to see the quantity of antibodies, the functional antibodies, 
then the effectiveness, that is how much the vaccine is working in a small group, then efficacy over a large uh, population when it is given for the population. So the efficacy is the real marker of, you know, how we know how the vaccine is performing at the level of the population. So efficacy data are available for Infantrix hexa. There are two studies. One was done in Italy, the other in Germany. The, in Germany, what they did was a case contact. So all positive uh, patient with pertussis, their secondary household contacts were given vaccination and seen how many of them got actual protection from the pertussis disease. So now, uh, you know, it was seen that the protective efficacy continued to remain between 84 to 89%. And Italy, the study was done for three plus zero without a booster in a general population to see the number of disease process that was reduced, uh, reduced after vaccination. So the number of disease process that were reduced were up to 84%. So we have real time world data of uh, protection, giving a protection against the disease to the tune of 84% reduction in cases when pertussis vaccination was given, which was Infanrix hexa, even without a booster. Now these Italian children were followed up later for five years age to look for the uh, continuation of the protection. And the continuation of the protection, even without the booster, after five years, the entire cohort was seen to remain uh, adequately protected to the tune of 84% even five years later. So we have what we, uh, what Infantrix Hexa has is a real time data to, uh, to uh, tell that it is effective even after three plus zero doses. The study, which is by the two component A cellular hexa, was a cynical study which showed to the protection of 74%. The pertussis protection with WP vaccine has been variable from 40 to 90% most of the vaccines. However, whenever WP was given as a hexavalent vaccine, the efficacy data as of now are not present. Looking at the efficacy on a long term, so it is uh, even not just the short term protection to look for the, you know, you look whether the disease, the vaccine has been able to reduce the number of cases in, an, in a given population or not. So for that, we, what we studied is efficacy follow up, number of cases in a population. So Infanrix Hexa boasts to have a study follow up, five year follow up of efficacy data and to look at the antigen levels of all six individual antigens which has been studied at a seven year follow, which is more, more than the other vaccines available. So it, it is coming with the scientific evidence against it. Now, polio protection, this is something, you know, this is a very, very important point that all of, of pediatricians, we need to remind ourselves that this needs to be done. So we, in 2016, the polio vaccines, OPV was switched over from trivalent to bivalent. So P2 was removed. Why was it removed? Well, because P2 was the commonest cause of vaccine-derived polio. So now the previous vaccination of either OPV or IPV will not work because if the child receives only OPV, the child will receive protection only against P1 and P3 will have no protection against P2. And this is the worst thing that we can do to a child. And polio is one disease which we definitely do not want it to enter. So injectable polio is imperative. Now injectable polio from the government setup is uh, the DIPV, the fractional dose of the IPV to be given intradermal, two doses uh, at six and uh, 14 weeks or uh, which gives the protection to the tune of 60% or the injectable polio intramuscular complete doses wherein the protection reaches to up to 100%. The protection varies from P1, P2 and P3 and P2 is the most notorious one wherein the antibody titers are not reached as much. So we are living in a country which is surrounded by the wild polio cases. 
So from November 20 to November 21, there have been three to four wild polio cases, three in Afghanistan, one in Pakistan, and more than 400 vaccine-derived paralytic polio. Most of them have been P2 um, polio viruses. So to give adequate protection, injectable polio is imperative, irrespective of the cost. Please give injectable polio to each and every child that is entering our clinic. So this is the schedule that we need to follow. The birth dose of OPV, three primary doses of OPV at 6, 10, 14 weeks, one booster between 6 to 18 months, and another booster at 4 to 5 years of age. So no child should be vaccinated with pentavalent and OPV without an IPV is a message which is what I'm trying to speak out on this slide. This is another trial. Now, these are independent studies. You know, these are not neck-to-neck -neck trial between the two vaccinations. The, so different vaccines that uh, open label randomized control in different centers, and they have been both put into a um, uh, same um, slide here. So in Fandrix Hexa, was, uh, the studies were done in four centers. And these are the number of people who uh, gave adequate protection against the individual component of the vaccine. And we can see that diphtheria, tetanus, hepatitis B, polio, all three were close to 100% of the people getting adequate zero protection. Though pertussis does not have an antibody level, is not a direct correlate, but along with the efficacy data that we already had, the number of antibodies were definitely present in 100% of the patient. In the WP hexa vaccination, this was again done in four centers and almost 300 patient, uh, children had participated. And the number of people who zero converted to educate level were a bit lower than they were with the infantrix hexa. And the, the polio is a concern for me here, wherein the polio um, uh, zero conversion did not happen to the tune of 100%. Okay. Now, this is a study which is given by GSK. There's a study was done, uh, um, is published in um, Indian Pediatrics as well. So this speaks about a baboon model, wherein a baboon was given a WP as well as a cellular pertussis. What was observed with the WP vaccine that um, apart from the humoral antibody response, it also initiated TH17, TH1, that is cellular arm of the immunity, which led to longer protection because it has an immune memory and it also has, uh, you know, reduced carriage of beta pertussis in the nose. So it will reduce the transmission of the beta pertussis in the environment. Now, this is the whole idea when WP model, WP was uh, promoted as a better vaccine for pertussis protection against the AP. However, in mouse model, when IPV was added to acellular pertussis, it acted as an adjuvant and it worked through the toll-like receptors, activating interleukin-2, activating the cellular arm of the immunity much more than what it did for the WP vaccine. So it, uh, so in, in nutshell, IPV increased the immunogenicity of pertussis in a, when it was combined with acellular pertussis vaccine, it did not increase the immunogenicity when it was combined with the whole cell vaccine. So probably this is what the data is saying. Do I have a efficacy data or real-time data to reduce the number of cases? Not really, but this is a mouse model, which we can see. A word on the effect on preterms, one, the preterms are definitely more prone to catch infections. They are more vulnerable. And with more and more uh, nursery graduates are uh, Dr. Pankaj working so hard, we have so many of them coming out and they have much more chances to get a severe pertussis and the probability of hospitalization is increased. Infantric hepsa has a label, you know, it has been studied in preterms and it can write it on the label that it can be done. Others are very well used. However, the label cannot promote it with the confidence. So to so meeting the three C's of confidence, con be confident that it is a, a effective vaccine. Convenience, it reduces the number. Comfort, the side effects are reduced. And I add the C, the cost is definitely reduced. It can be used in preterms. We have real world efficacy data against 
pertussis for five to seven years. We have real world immune persistent data for all other antigens for more than seven years. And this vaccine has been there for 20 years in practice. It has been good, right? Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am, for a very elaborate uh, presentation and discussion on all the aspects of this vaccine. Uh, so uh, we would uh, follow up with some of the frequently asked questions. Uh, we've compiled uh, five of the most frequently asked questions in uh, various platforms. I would be sharing my screen. Uh, Dr. Somya, before that, can we take a small question? Dr. Raj Mehta is asking, do you mean acellular, uh, acellular vaccine is better? <laughs> well, that's a big question. Dr. Rajwad, no, I don't mean that. No, I don't mean that. My, in my starting slide, I said it's important to vaccinate. It is not important to know which vaccine to give. My talk is okay. The acellular will get lesser side effects and the cost is perfectly fine. Between which one of them is better, you know, the WP still carries a bit more protection of a longer protection of pertussis as compared to the acellular in a very small set of study. You know, we had um, the pertussis resurgence happening in multiple countries and wherein the causes were figured out, many of them had reduced the second booster. Some of them had the vaccination levels were going down. Only in US, you know, there was a proper resurgence after um, acellular pertussis, but the numbers were definitely aggravated by a good, uh, you know, surveillance program that they ran. However, with the uh, frequent boosting, you know, five years and 10 years boosting, we can say that the longer protection will continue. And the boosting dose is recommended whether or not you used a WP or an AP. So the advantage of long protection of WP is circumvented when you have a booster dose as well. So I am not saying AP is better. I am saying AP is more convenient and comfortable to be given in children in pediatric practice. So I think Dr. Raj, that uh, gives answer to your question. So basically, it's uh, sometimes you have to choose a more pain and uh, a vaccine which is maybe one two percent more effective, or less pain or a vaccine which may be same or maybe one percent less effective. So sometimes what parents' uh, perceptions and wants and uh, needs are, you have to honor that also, because as Dr. Shalini said. Many a times families are uh, not convenient giving too much pain and not going for future vaccination. So compliance also has to be looked into. Right, Dr. Shalini? True that, Dr. Sam. All of us sitting in an OPD, we know, you know, the uh, howling child and a panting parent calling us in the middle of night. So might as well give them a vaccine which will keep both the parent and the mother fine and give an educate protection, not less. I think we as a clinician to uh, give a clear message to the parents that these are the options. And if still they choose them, let's go ahead. Perfect. So now, and that's uh, the right approach. Uh, to Dr. Somia to discuss the uh, frequently asked questions, please. Thank you, sir. This was one of the frequently asked questions already asked now. So uh, uh, we'll still continue. So this was um, uh, the first commonly asked question, how to make a choice between the available vaccines uh, be it a pentavalent or a hexavalent vaccine. Uh, Ma'am, a word on this. And Dr. Swami, I've been already elabor I've already elaborated in my talk. I will choose an hexavalent because of multiple reasons. The first reason is I don't want to miss on the IPV protection. I've spoken educate about the polio, which is, you know, I fear that, you know, we see that there are so many vaccination charts coming into clinic. We're given only pentavalent and OPV. You know, mm -hmm. it is even worse than uh, at least the child should have fractional dose of IPV, you know. So I am concerned about polio. That's why I want to give an hexavalent. Uh, hepatitis B is another thing which should not be missed. The small role of pentavalent vaccine wherein the DPT, IPV and HIP can be given mm -hmm. when I'm using a 0614 course of uh, hepatitis B and to cost cut, I might give a 10th week dose of a pentavalent vaccine. But then again, uh, we have different types and we can always use them. 
so it should not be a bigger problem. Did we lose Dr. Somia here? Yeah, I think she lost connectivity. She lost connectivity. I know. I know. Dr. Manish, what is your take on the vaccine, the whole cell or the acellular? <laughs> See, frankly speaking, we as clinicians know our 70 to 80 percent of the parents what they would go for. So, and in the other 20, 30 percent, we give them options. And we know there are kind of patients who are uh, limited with their budgets. Even many a times I do tell the, my patient, don't even come to me for vaccination. Take them to that government center and whatever is not there, you come to us. So our role as a clinician, pediatrician is to ensure that vaccine to the patient. Yes. Whether he yes. takes from government, he takes uh, cellular or acellular, these are the minor differences. Yes. So I would That's a very, very important take-home message. If somebody is asking me, ki mujhe OPV de do, pentavalent de do, rather than that, you just go to the government setup, you know. That, that would be better for the child's protection. Yes, Dr. Somia has joined back. Sorry, sorry for that glitch. Uh, okay, so uh, basically, in the nutshell, it is very important uh, not to miss out on the injectable polio vaccine, particularly to give the protection for the type 2. Uh, to keep up the elimination in our country. Uh, so it's very important not to miss and uh, the best uh, comfortable way would be to pick a hexavalent vaccine. Moving on to the next question. Protection against pertussis has always been a debate between the whole cell pertussis containing vaccine or a acellular. Ma'am, you've already uh, spoken about already spoken a word about. on that. We already spoke, you know, all said and done, pertussis, whatever said and done, we've not been able to give a complete coverage. You know, the maximum we see is 84%. That's not what we want against a menace, but that's what we have. Now, uh, for wanting to have a correlate of protection against pertussis, it always remains a debate between acellular and WP. Had we had a clear correlate, the answer would have been easy. So we don't have it. So what we have to depend upon is a real world data. Where the, was the disease adequately controlled and where did the disease was not controlled? Now, we always would like WP because we thought it has multiple um, antigens and it will give a complete protection. But somehow with time, we know that with the different studies from the WP, some of them had a good protection and the others did not. So it, it, the fact did not uh, remain uh, very well proven. Then there was another debate from our older pediatricians that after giving pertussis vaccine, the case ha cases have reduced. Yes, they did reduce, not because it was a better vaccine, but because more and more children were given vaccines. So when we go and compare this with a developed world wherein everybody was vaccinated, it, the, you know, the uh, numbers were not very encouraging. That was another thing. Third thing is we got the pertussis relapse in multiple countries, as I told you earlier as well. So when looked into the relapse, it was figured out that some of the uh, places they became complacent that the, they thought the number of diseases has gone down so less, let me just take off the booster dose. In some of the cases, because the political unrest or the government unwill, then uh, um, the number of people who were getting vaccinated had reduced. And um, then uh, the only case, the only place where there was actual resurgence was US, as I told you earlier as well, wherein the long-term effectiveness of WP was definitely better. There is no doubt about it. However, which can be, you know, even in spite of that, they did not go back to the ACL or to WP vaccine. So the point, the, you know, uh, how did they circumvent the problem was to introduce another booster at the age of 10 years along with the DT vaccine. So yes, so these are the facts. They're not, not in black and white. There's so many pros, so many cons. So this is something, uh, you know, you will never get a clear answer to. Correct, ma'am. So basically to summarize, uh, either of the vaccine, either of the good uh, vaccine can be used humanize a child in, in his uh, pediatric age group. And um, after that, a regular boosting shot should be given to keep up the immune system. Yes. And when we look at a vaccine, it should be a vaccine compared to another vaccine rather than a category to category because 
a whole cell produces vaccine um, would is, is very variable in its immunogenicity response as well as uh, in the real world uh, efficacy data. So it would not make much of a statement if we compare category to category, but we would require uh, the evidence for each particular vaccine to make a decision. Thank you so much, ma'am. Moving on, um, again, a similar, I think we have covered what is the future for producers protection with vaccines, AP or whole cell producers. Dr. Somia, we live Why in a country of Vada Pav and McDonald burgers, you know. So we are a huge country huge socioeconomic differences, huge mindsets, and we have freedom of thought. So what are we looking at AP and WP? We're looking at it at both. None of the vaccine is going anywhere, you know. And what we need to on these platform is ensure that every vaccine is given to every child. And we let them choose. Absolutely, ma'am, I agree. Each and every child should be given the advantage of a vaccine. So how important is a full dose of IPV versus um, um, Okay, I, I've IPV already elaborated in my talk, and this is something I want to speak again because I want to make the point again. It is very, very important to give a full dose of IPV. So what we have is vaccine-derived paralytic polio, which is becoming a big, big menace. How do we circumvent that? We can circumvent that only after giving a uh, full dose of IPV scheduler. Um, why the fractional dose, fractional dose was introduced only for the want of the amount of the uh, doses that was required. No children were required to be protected and lesser amount of the vaccine was being produced because it was a sudden decision taken. That was the only rationale of giving fractional dose IPV. However, it is based on robust evidence. So there are three studies. The one was the WHO, wherein the SAGE group recommended using these two doses at two, six and 14 weeks in multiple countries, around four countries, which had high prevalence of a probability of VDPV, and we were switching from oral to injectable. There was another study done by Nirmal Atal, which showed a very good 90% protection with two doses of fractional IPV. And there was a third study, which was done by, it was done in Bangladesh, wherein they used a multiple, multiple jet injector, and they did also give a good response. The one which is based on the fractional, the one which, uh, the study which is, uh, from which the recommendations are given by the government of India give protection to the tune of 55%. Now imagine our entire, uh, all the children of India, 55% of them are protected against uh, polio. And that is going to reduce the spread of the virus. This is going to give a herd immunity and give you better protection against if you say 20% of the children get 100% protection. So when the uh, decisions are based on such criteria, they do they look at the disease reduction at a larger scale in the at the level of the nation. They do not look at the individual protection and very well so if that is how the world works. But however, sitting in a clinical setup, when a child is coming to me, asking me to protect his uh, her child against injectable polio, give her the best protection. I am going to give this child three plus one plus one protection. That is 100% protection against P1, P2, and P3, all of them taken together. So it's, it's very, very important to give a full dose of polio protection to ensure complete protection against all three viruses in an individual child. Hope yeah. that was not confusing. Dr. Shalini, from that point of view, if some individual parents ask me at clinic, sir, should I go for IPV at government hospital or should I go for IPV at your clinic? Sir, it depends on the In case he wants a 100% protection, take it in my clinic. But if you're short of money, take two fractional doses there, come back, I'll give you a one full dose of IPV here later. Right, exactly. Okay, Dr. Somia, next. Very well said. This was uh, the last question. Uh, with this, we can invite more uh, questions from the audience. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for uh, covering most of the points uh, in the presentation itself. Uh, it was very well uh, said and discussed. Thank you for that. Now we can take more questions. Uh, we can stop sharing screen, Dr. Somia.
any other comments from the delegates or uh, panelists we can have i have also promoted dr alok yadav he is also one of the our iap north delhi members and he wanted to raise some comments or queries dr alok you are there dr alok okay one com uh, question is which vaccine combination is yes dr alok hello yes sir good very nice talk and very elaborate talk by ma'am i just have one query regarding the opg vaccination i want to know if there is any recommendation by the uit or iap at what opg vaccination is recommended how the previously as a government of india is also giving the opg vaccination go to do vaccination but and right now after the covid time after so long months one or two vaccination drives are Uh, given by the government of India, so is there any recommendation right now by uh, uh, pediatrician in the place that we can give OPV vaccine? One question. Uh, Doctor, now I firmly believe that all pediatric OPVs should stop keeping keeping OPVs. There is no role of any OPV in our routine immunization practices. We have to give IPV only. OPV is only at birth. and the only opv that is to be given is a government pulse polio campaign and that is not something which is going to come you know it is going to come to your or my knowledge it is something that the government decides and they give them so all as a pediatrician we just have to tell them ki as and when the uh, program is there in your vicinity because the government decides it uh, area wise go ahead and take it and don't say no that is what our job is okay okay thank you doctor you have one very good argument is there any I couldn't hear the question. Could you, Doctor Manish? Ah uh, no, actually his voice quality is. It's not clear actually. Doctor Alok, I think it would be better if you uh, write your questions in the chat box and then we can read it because your voice is not getting that audible. Uh, Doctor Alok, please write in the chat box or Q and A. We'll take it up. Doctor Alok. Please, uh, yeah, please write it there. Till that, we can take uh, two other questions. Uh, which uh, Dr. Satakshi Avasti is asking Dr. Shalini, which vaccine combination is preferable for booster at 18 months? Uh, Dr. Satakshi, we have to give DPT, we have to give Hib, and we have to give IPV. It does not matter what you use. What is important is you give them these all three vaccines at the in your um, OPD. Now, whether you want to give a quadrivalent and IPV separate, or you want to give a combination, it doesn't matter. That depends upon one the uh, pain capacity of the parent. Second, we have one-on-one -on -one talk about the side effects. As regards efficacy trial, there is no significant difference if the person is taking proper. Uh, booster doses at one and a half months, one and a half year, five years, and ten years. Yes, uh, and Dr. Agita Sharma is asking any advantage of giving first vaccine as wholesale uh, pertussis and next two as uh, acellular pertussis, like in Fendi. I have not come across any such study which has done these kind of tests, and going by the logic, it makes no sense to do so. Right. And Dr. Alok Yadav now has written his question. What he was asking was age of OPV recommendation. Any now under IAP UIP? IAP UIP is very clear. Birth dose of OPV followed by IPV is three plus one plus one, and all pulse polio less than five years of age should be taken. Right. So I think we have had excellent discussion on this. Uh, Three C's of uh, acellular pertussis vaccinations, hexa vaccines, and we will wind up this session. So I thank our speaker and chairpersons, Dr. Shalini Tyagi and Dr. Somia Agarwal, for a wonderful discussion. And the take-home message, obviously, is each child should get the vaccine, and we should give the clear signs to the parents and let them decide what they want to choose. and a uh, acellular good vaccine which is available with hexavalent that option should be given and if they can afford we should go ahead right yes right okay thank you ma'am so you. now uh, thank, thank you. you so now thank we you. go ahead with our uh, next two talks so uh,
uh, first we'll have a discussion on management of asthma what are the current gina guidelines and i would be taking that uh, presentation so i'll just share my screen yeah Okay, so I think uh, every one of us knows about GINA, Global Initiative for Asthma. Last 30 years or so, we have been getting every three year, two year, now even yearly updates on GINA. So GINA is the global strategy for asthma management and prevention. It was established by WHO and NHLBI in 1993 to increase awareness about asthma and just to speak loudly and about it, it, that almost 5 lakh copies of GINA reports are downloaded each year from 100 countries. So that is the mammoth uh, document, mammoth research, which has been looked into by all over the asthma practitioners, whether they are in adult asthma, pediatric asthma, that these reports are being relied upon to treat about the latest science of pediatric asthma. Now, recommendations are, friend, I will not go into much detail. We all know the grade of recommendation and how uh, good this evidence comes and then only these are accepted by Gina and they, they give to us. So before we start with the latest uh, guideline about the uh, Gina management of asthma, a word about COVID-19 and asthma. Are people with asthma at increased risk of COVID-19 or severe COVID? People with asthma do not appear to be at increased risk of COVID because systemic reviews have showed that the patients who were well controlled on ICS, they actually had lesser episode of COVID. Only those patients who have had taken oral corticosteroids in last two to four weeks had severe asthma. So what the recommendations are for COVID prevention in asthma patient is that they should take their ICS quite regularly and keep their asthma in control. And it was seen that most of the asthmatic patients who were well controlled with asthma therapy had actually fewer episodes of asthma exacerbations. Then what about the spirometry and nebulizations during the times of COVID to, to prevent the spread of COVID, it was advisable to avoid them. Vaccinations, all vaccinations routinely was uh, advisable only at the day of biologics. If the patient is on biologics, uh, grade 5 asthma on treatment, on the day of uh, biologic, this vaccination has to be avoided. And for flu vaccine, a gap of 2 to 4 weeks should be followed. That is what CDC recommends. Now coming to treatment of asthma in adults and adolescents. Like previously, we have less than 5 year, 5 to 12 year. Again, the same uh, uh, categories we'll have less than 5 years, 6 to 11 year and adolescents and adults. So more than 11 year is presently what we'll discuss. Asthma, we all know, is the most common chronic non-communicable disease affecting over 260 million people globally. And the main diagnostic points are variable respiratory symptoms and variable expiratory flow air expiratory airflow limitation so the variable is in between patients are fine diurnal variations are also there and variable expiratory reversibility mainly reversibility is there with different exercise triggers and with their treatment with reversible bronchoconstriction being documented in various studies and they'll have exacerbation by like seasonal exacerbation or exposure to certain triggers and all this. This is all we know which diagnoses asthma and already we have seen that in beautiful discussion by Dr. Shalini how to have clinical and investigation uh, confirmations in the asthma. Now basically the three triad which we are going to follow and we all follow in asthma diagnosis is first is the assessment, second is adjustment, and third is reviewing your diagnosis. So what do you assess? You confirm the diagnosis if necessary, symptom control and modifiable risk factors, including lung function, see the comorbidities. Comorbidities in the form of allergic rhinitis, atopic dermatitis, 
or GRD. And looking and checking the inhaler technique is very important because this is the disease mainly you are going to rely on your inhaled corticosteroid. This is not a simple drug or syrup treatment that you are given and patient is following it. So at each follow-up, checking that or before changing into the next up, stepping the treatment, it is very important to you see the inhaler technique and compliance and adherence to your treatment. Then adjusting the treatment of modifiable risk factors, comorbidities, like controlling the triggers, further uh, dust mite or uh, allergen exposure, which has to be controlled before again stepping up the treatment and reviewing. If your patient is not following like asthma, you review your diagnosis. If your patient is improving, then you review your therapy, your technique of therapy, you review your adherence. So all that has to go on. Now in 2019, a fundamental change in asthma management came. And I'm surprised to see many treatments still we are still sticking to our last decade of treatment, what we are following that as and when in step one you require, you give salbutamol. In step two, you give ICS and still with exacerbation, you give salbutamol. But that has actually changed in last two years. So even in step one, now they recommend whenever you require a reliever, you don't give plain salbutamol. It has to be followed by ICS. In step Two also, whenever you are giving ICS, if there is exacerbation, again you give with uh, Saba or Lava, you give an ICS. So basically ICS is must to give a prevent future control over the exacerbation as we will see. So for safety, Gina no longer recommends Saba, that is short acting beta agonist only treatment for step one in adolescents and adults. And the decision was based on the evidence that Saba only treatment increases the risk of severe exacerbations. Gina now recommends that all adults and adolescents with asthma should re uh, receive low dose ICS and LABA or Saba or and ICS. So the ICS can be delivered by regular daily treatment in mild asthma or as needed low dose ICS for metrol. And what it recommends is it very much emphasizes that this is a population level risk reduction strategy like statins, antihypertensive, these were the watershed treatment kind of the things. Similarly, it recommended that the aim is to reduce the probability of serious adverse outcomes at a population level and individual patient may not be necessarily experiencing short-term clinical benefit. But in long-term overall morbidity and mortality very much will go down with this, this uh, approach. So it has been seen that in mild asthma, still there is a risk of serious adverse event because it was seen that in 30 to 37 percent of adults with acute asthma, 16 percent of patients with near fatal asthma and 15 to 20 percent of adults dying of asthma. See, so this is almost one out of four or one out of five. They had symptoms less than weekly in previous three months till they had this severe sudden attack. And exacerbation triggers were unpredictable. They would, could have been viruses, pollens, pollution, or poor adherence. And inhaled Saba has been the first-line treatment for asthma for 50 years, dating from an era when asthma was thought to be a disease of bronchoconstriction. Its role has been reinforced by rapid relief of symptoms and low cost. And starting treatment with Saba trains the patient to regard it as their primary asthma treatment. So what happens is patient thinks this Saba, plain levosalbutamol or salbutamol is good enough and he keeps on taking that. And what harms it causes? Let's look into that. Regular use of Saba even for one to two weeks is associated with severe adverse effects. What are they? Beta receptor down regulation, decreased bronchoprotection, rebound hyperresponsiveness, Decreased bronchodilator response, increased allergic response, and increased eosinophilic airway inflammation. 
and obviously these are the things we don't want in our uh, adolescent and uh, adolescent patients to happen because that will decrease the future control and increase the morbidity increase the exacerbation higher use of saba has been found to be associated with adverse clinical outcomes when there was a dispensing of more than 3 canisters per year it is associated with higher risk of severe exacerbations more than 12 canisters per year is associated with much higher risk of death so this has been well evidence study proven so ics it reduces the risk of asthma deaths hospitalization and exacerbations requiring oral corticosteroids but adherence is poor particularly in patients with mild or infrequent symptoms so what do you do is a very good safe and effective alternative is you use low dose ics formetrol as reliever as preferred approach so whenever you require a reliever whenever there is even mild exacerbation in such adolescents instead of using only saba as was recommended 3 years 2 years 5 years back now the recommendation is you use ics low dose formetrol so ics formetrol as reliever reduces the risk of exacerbations compared with using saba alone with similar symptom control or similar lung function the other recommendation to control the cost because if he the patient has to buy ics formetrol that will again increase the cost initially to buy to change over from saba and plain ics to that so for track 2 also you can follow if the track 1 is not possible then what patient is going to do is whenever he takes saba he takes his ics dose with that so that controls the inflammation together only so treatment may be stepped up or down within a track using the same reliever at each step or switch between the tracks according to patient's need and preferences hope i am clear in this that previously recommended only saba in adolescent has to be replaced preferably by low dose ics formetrol what is low dose ics formetrol it is 100 microgram of budesonide with formetrol or if patient at present is not able to buy whenever he takes saba it should be followed by his ics dose whatever he is taking so as you can see clearly in this in track 1 step 1 step 2 you take as needed low dose ics formetrol step 3 low dose maintenance ics formetrol and further is same whatever we were following other track is other alternative approach is take ics whenever saba taken then again low dose maintenance ics and reliever as and when required so only saba taken is not any longer recommended and that should not be followed so what we used to say asthma action plan or that now has to be low dose ics formetrol preferably or saba followed by ics <coughs> why is this preferred for adolescent and adolescents because using low dose ics formetrol as reliever reduces the risk of severe exacerbations compared with regimens with saba as reliever and how is it used a patient at any treatment step has asthma symptoms he has to take uh, maintenance and reliever therapy so whenever he takes formetrol with this low dose ics it goes and it acts as controller that and there only and it prevents future exacerbations so when this should be used obviously we have discussed this when track 1 is not possible you can use step uh, track 2 this way we, uh, we have all discussed this so what difference was found severe exacerbations were reduced by about 2/3 in large double blind study and in an open label study in patients previously taken saba alone so you can see 66% of exacerbation were reduced with this approach compared with low dose ics other studies also showed similar thing non inferior in two large blind studies 25 to 50% of dose was required compared with maintenance low dose ics 
and symptom control had very small difference. Then lung function, very small difference. So this is with compared with when only low dose ICS you are giving or only Saba you are giving. Instead of that, you are using Saba with ICS. So severe exacerbation, we all know the triggers can be viral, allergen, exposure, air pollution or stress and ICS are highly effective in mild asthma, but patients are often poorly adherent. So whenever you are giving, this is they are presuming that in step to low dose ICS, what we are recommending, it is less likely that patient is going to 100% compliant and is going to stick to his uh, recommended protocols. So whenever he requires Saba, that time if you are giving ICS, whenever he is requiring Saba instead of Saba, if you are giving low dose ICS with Laba, it is definitely going to get better future symptom control. So primary outcome variable of one study was well-controlled asthma weeks, but this outcome was not considered reliable as it was based on earlier concept of asthma control and was systematically biased against the as-needed ICS for metrol treatment group. Then no significant treatment was observed in treatment effect compared with as-needed SABA or daily ICS with high versus low baseline isnophil or pheno. So all asthma patient where whatever their isnophilic inflammation or pheno demonstrated, they had similar response. There is no evidence for safety or efficacy of Saba only treatment and patients with infrequent symptoms can still have severe or fatal exacerbations. And these are often unpredictable as already we have seen. So the distinction between less than or more than twice a month is arbitrarily and not evidence-based. So in step one, two also, it is better to give ICS whenever you require Saba or Laba for an exacerbation. So these are again the same way I have seen. These are the current recommended guidelines by uh, Gina for children between uh, adolescents and adults basically. So this is the same flow chart again showing you whatever we have seen in track one, you use MART therapy on track two, you use uh, this way, uh, Saba with ICS. And basic recommendation is in step one, whatever you require this, you use ICS with that. So these are the just that now Gina does not distinguish between intermittent and mild persistent asthma. And step one, step two treatment has been merged. And they say, whenever you require, you can follow this MART therapy for both step one and step two, because previously intermittent was step one and mild persistent was step two. And now they have merged and you, they advise the same treatment for both categories. So hence, again, this uh, after this, you follow your ICS uh, medium dose LABA, medium dose ICS LABA in step three or higher dose uh, ICS LABA in step four. And in step five, you require again uh, your uh, maybe uh, intermittent oral corticosteroids or biologics or now the LAMA, the long acting muscarinic antagonist have been added in this. And these are the severity of the percentage severity of patients in adolescents and say, adults which uh, are defined as more severe or highly intensive treatment, which are 24%, 3.7% are very severe asthma and 17% are difficult to treat asthma. Now, these are the long-acting muscarinic antagonists which have been recommended in step five. And though to us at our general pediatric practice, very less, lack, very less of this patient present to us, they present more to pediatric pulmonologists and more in adults. So basically the various options in this are, this three triple combinations are there, beclamethasone, formetrol, glycoperinium, or you have fluticasone, furoate, villantroil, and unmicolidinum. Even myself, I have not used this. Uh, I actually did not need to use this because maybe such severe patient present more to pediatric pulmonologist or adult pulmonologist. 
So I'll just skip this part. Then an add-on azithromycin also three days a week have been studies and an anti-inflammatory effect. I think these two steps in step five, these two options better we should leave to a dedicated pediatric pulmonologist rather than we as a general pediatrician venturing into this. So we should stick to till step three and that is my practice in step three further if you are required treatment, I often refer them to uh, a dedicated pediatric pulmonologist for further approach after checking obviously his adherence, his technique, his compliance, that is very important. And it is very important that in all this patient at each visit, we should ask them to bring their devices, their uh, spacers, their huff, their spacers, their huff puff kit, their inhalers, and we should check them. And now all of them are coming with dose counters. Uh, writing the dose counter, dose number at your follow-up visits is very important so that next time you can check what it is being followed. This again is step five, the biologics, various homolizumab and all this used more for pediatric pulmonologists to be used. Now comes the treatment of asthma in children that is mainly six to 11 years. Again, in this step one, King ICS, whenever Saba is taken, is preferred over daily ICS as poor adherence is highly likely. So again, there is a change in this recommendation that whenever you require Saba, you take ICS. And daily ICS is preferred over taking ICS whenever Saba is taken in step two. So this is for children between six to 11 years. This again change. This is the newer track you can see. Step one, lower dose ICS taken whenever Saba is taken. And the other option is consider daily dose ICS. So previously, step one was only Saba when, as and when required. Now, low dose ICS whenever Saba is taken. That is preferred. So this is step one. I'm talking about children 6 to 11 year. And this is a very predominant number of uh, children which present to us with asthma at our clinic. So this change has to be noted by all pediatricians and has to be followed. Again, the same thing. Further, all the stages and treatment, they remain same. So this is again uh, demonstrating the same MART therapy, what we followed in adolescence, that whenever you require, you use low-dose uh, ICS uh, formatrol for exacerbations. Only if patient cannot buy then continue with what he is taking and that time give an extra dose of ICS. But uh, do mind it that when you are using for MART therapy, you have to have low dose ICS with formatrol. You can't use your medium dose or high dose in that therapy. Then this is same. This is the current table being recommended as low dose, medium dose. This, I think we are all aware of this and I am just running short of the time. So we'll just go further with this. So that completes my talk on current guidelines of GINA and update. We can discuss any queries if we have. So me being more of a general practitioner, doing a bit of asthma practice since last 20 years, we have two dedicated pediatric pulmonologists with us. They can tell us more about step four and step five. Dr. Manish, in spite of working on pulmonology practice, I still believe that 99.9% .9 of the patients are very well controlled with our step one, two, Exactly. Uh, only, you know, so a right diagnosis, a right compliance, a right technique and comorbidity continues to remain. Uh, the only thing that I would want to add from my experience is doing an SPT early, you know, is something that is the only thing which is, uh, and immunotherapy is the only thing which is going to modify the disease process, rest or our controller. 
though we do not have very you know world level antigens allergens available but that should be offered at least to the parent and leave it to them whether they want to go ahead with that or not exactly in fact in uh, recent cad module at the iap platform i was commenting the same thing we are quite under using the immunotherapy uh, which we should be using at step 1 step 2 we think of using at step 3 4 which that time multiple trigger already sensitization has happened and specially in allergic rhinitis at least because that is not going to go away there it should be preferred much early So that yeah. is, but I have I have seen this uh, recommendation of using ICS with Saba still in many prescription. It is not being followed very much. So that change at practice level still has to happen. Many changes need to happen. <laughs> We need to at least uh, you know convince. I feel that most of us doctors are not convinced enough to use inhaled corticosteroids for longer periods. You know we are scared. We end up giving a prescriptions for a month or maybe for fifteen days, and, and then you know the parents are lost to follow. We uh, you kind of we fail to tell them that you know you don't stop it. We need to control your disease process for longer. So yes, that is required for sure. Okay, yeah, but also, I think. I, yeah, I yeah, know yeah, it's short, Shalini, but yeah, ahead. you are totally right, uh, Dr. Shalini. In fact, we as a pulmonologist only, another pediatrician should uh, practice, and we are actually. I am actually telling the patient that you need it for six months to a year. So they have to be mentally prepared, mentally and they prepared do it. For a year. And they do it. And regarding SPT, yes, I'm doing SPT in many patients in only allergic rhinitis, and we get to know the triggers early, and they are able to taper down their doses. That is true. Doctor, I need to answer you about stage three, four, and five. It becomes important to know the phenotype of asthma from the very beginning. So we have to divide them into uh, type two or the neutrophilic asthma. The treatment protocol will go beyond that, and very rarely some of the adolescents we ended up, uh, you know, facing such situations. Um, very, very minute uh, people very, are there. I think mainly, very mainly the obese, are. obese ones. Yeah, problems. mostly the obese and those who are um, uh, refracted to the treatment because they are actually giving the treatment again and again. Three and four are very less. More often they go on one and two, and we are so able to treat using them. Using yeah. the use of omalizumab or tiotropin. Very less. Is very less. so one in my. Ten years of practice, yeah. one omalizumab is you know something that we for a center which uses around hundred mepolizumabs per year. That is the maximum in the entire India. So for children requiring that is minuscule. At AIMS now they are offering omalizumab, not before when I was doing my tenure. But now Dr. Kabra is offering omalizumab, but again the prices problem and all this is there. But in very selected cases, very selected. The price and it is not covered in the in insurance. Our abroad, it is covered. So this is the difference. But very uh, few cases require. I think the obese, refractory treatment, high IG level, and many others. Okay. So Best thank you. I think with this we'll conclude this session. And now we move away to a very important session by. What's new in TB management guidelines? And we have a very good uh, pediatric respiratory expert to. Uh, Give talk on that. So we invite Dr. Jasmeet Kaur Vadva. She is pediatric pulmonologist at Balaji Action Hospital and presently secretary of Pediatric Respiratory Society Delhi. So welcome, Dr. Jasmeet. Uh, we'll have talk on childhood tuberculosis recent updates, Dr. Jasmeet. Okay. Audio. Okay. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, just switch it off. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's going to be good evening. I think this is a very important uh, talk, and uh, there had been recent guidelines in 2020 and 21. I will be talking just about the update uh, regarding this, and uh, so we'll start with that. Uh, so we know that the childhood uh, tuberculosis is under 14 years of the age group in the RNDCP guidelines. they have reported no this is the reported part means that uh, sorry just a minute i have to yes yeah uh, remove this also okay so child what is the epidemiology right now 
it says that the child under the 14 years of the age group, the, uh, the TB guidelines have reported that there is 10% of more than the increase of tuberculosis burden. Now, uh, these are the reported features. There are so many we are not reporting to the RNTCP. So every pediatrician or practitioner who is treating TB patients should report it to the RNTCP. This is very important. There has been an exponential rise, more than 40% of the cases load in certain high incidence community. Now we are facing the crisis because during the past two years, the COVID era, the, uh, the incidence has increased in children. And now in 2025, uh, the India has told to eradicate tuberculosis and WHO has uh, given the guideline, uh, the recommendation to decrease the incidence by 80% and the death by 90%. So the mortality maximally rise in less than five years of the age group. And that too because of severe illness, the tuberculosis meningitis and disseminated illness. So this epidemiology is, this is now increasing. So we have to be more and more cautious regarding reporting and reporting recognizing resistant TB and how to adequately treat the children. So now there's a shift in the paradigm by the diagnosis that is, we all know in children, it is mostly clinical as the children have possibility disease. Now replacing the PPD test to radiology, this is very important. Either it is a chest X-ray or ultrasound or whichever the best you will feel, a lymph node, uh, whichever way, uh, the system is involved. So a new categorization is there. I think everybody knows about it now, must be using it. Now there is no category of one, two, and three that is not, is not there. So every case has to be treated as a new TB case. They have the, you have to identify which type of TB it is, which system it is involvement. Accordingly, you have to give the treatment. And you have to also see that you're not uh, giving, uh, uh, you have also identifying any resistance to that or those children who are not improving the treatment. And again, to go for, the molecular diagnosis and then for the treatment. So the shift is for the categorization and the diagnosis. How? Now the smear is okay. We keep on ordering smear, but now there's a shift from smear to the microbiological diagnosis, which is a CBNAT cartridge-based nuclear acid amplification test and the line probe assays. The culture remains the gold standard. Most of the time, the LPA are not available in the practice. I mean, the private practice. So CBNAT is well available. Smear, okay, we order, but we go to molecular diagnosis in the form of CBNAT and TUNAT, LPA, and the culture sensitivity is very important. So I will be going further first with the categorization. Now, these are the guidelines by the RNTCP in 2020, which was uh, published also. This is very important to understand now. The regime is of two doses of uh, two, year, uh, two months of INH, rifampus, and parazinamide ethambutol with four months of uh, uh, INH, rifampus, and ethambutol, which are the categories which involve in this. First, the new microbiologically confirmed pulmonary TB case. If you're not able to confirm microbiologically, then new clinically diagnosed pulmonary TB case. This is important. Wherever possible, you should be able to uh, diagnose them by taking a gastric aspirate, induced sputum, or bronchoscopy. But uh, if not, then clinically diagnosed. Then new microbiologically confirmed extra pulmonary TB, like lymph node TB, or TB uh, meningitis, or abdominal TB, or TB spine, even a cellular TB. I'm able, uh, now I'm seeing one under, uh, sorry, orbital TB also, wherever the thing. So you have to, uh, even in those cases, and or those who are new clinically diagnosed extra pulmonary TB, if you're not able to isolate AFB from them. Initially, we used to give the category two treatment with starting with streptomycin to relapse and retreatment cases, but now it has changed scenario. Why? First, there is loss to follow up in those cases. They are not adequately treated or they are not taking the treatment in the fear of injections. Second, we are, if we are dealing with some resistant to rifampicin or INH or any first line drug, so we are giving that medicine again. So we are increasing the resistance again. So every case who has been previously treated but not adequately treated, 
those who have got recurrence treatment after loss to follow up in the last course of treatment or treatment after failure. All these children, all these patients should not be given a streptomycin injection or any other drug like levofloxacin, whatever we added, please, please. Again, these children need to be screened for their bacilli, AFB, if possibly by a smear or by the CBNAT or the microbiological uh, so the testing by the, uh, uh, the what we're going to do a molecular diagnosis or the culture. And if you find that the resistance is not there by either of the first line of treatment, first line of drugs, then you straight away go for a new case like 2-HRZE and 4-HRZE. This is totally recommended. We are seeing such patients right now and I'm treating according to this guideline and mind it, they're getting totally cured and uh, they don't need streptomycin or any other medication. No, this six months treatment will be increased to 10 uh, to uh, 12 months treatment in the case of spinal TB, joint TB, and the bone TB, and CSF TB2. And in the case of disseminated TB, it will increase to nine months. So this continuation phase can occur. So this is a very important uh, uh, shift, which is important. So nothing to add with the any other drug. So the next comes the diagnosis, which is clinical based on history, radiology. Initially, we were doing PPD tests with every child, which is not required now. Good history, radiology, and demonstration or isolation of the AFB bacilli. It, at every step, whatever possible, if you the patient is in periphery, I know it is difficult, a best gastric aspirate, possibility of induced sputum who is trained in it. If you're in the tertiary, please, you can have, there's an x-ray finding the child is not able to produce sputum or it is very difficult to take it out, you can go for bronchoscope. So AFB smear, now when we go for uh, the isolation of the bacteria, there is a um, big shift from AFB smear to the molecular diagnosis in the form of rapid NAT, CB NAT, which I'm talking, or gene expert for TB, in which we recognize RIF resistance, which is possible. Now it has got a very high sensitivity and specificity in generally pulmonary uh, secretions, even in the tubo, uh, in the lymph nodes and in the other, where there is a high suspicion of clinical suspicion of TB. But you do not do it in blood sample, please. This is an important, this should not be done. You're finding a you know, where is the problem, but you feel it's a tuberculosis. The x-ray is normal, but you're straight away going for gene expert for TB in the blood. Please don't go for it. It's not at all sensitive in that. So it should be done in the, wherever you find that the possibility of bacilli can be there. And most of the time the smears are negative, but this molecular diagnosis comes up in the form of positivity and with the, either with a RIF resistance or not. So this is an important test, highly sensitive and specific, and it comes in few hours. Some labs might take one day or two days, but not more than that. Then comes line probe essay, which is not available in uh, private sector, but it is available in the TB recognized center. It is a multiplex of NAT, and it recognizes the first and the second line drug sensitivity, though it is only recognizing on the smear positive. Uh, 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 pro, uh, smear positive means already you have a smear positivity in that, then only it can recognize Bungo for first and second line drug sensitivity. So it's a little less sensitive than. Uh, this rapid NAT, but it's still uh, recommended because it is faster. Three to four days, you get the report of first and second line drug sense. Three to four days, maybe 10 days. But now, the, all samples should be sent for culture, which is important. Why? Because no, this only takes four weeks, six weeks, and eight weeks to come. But if the patient having some RIF resistant or uh, INH resistant not improving, these cultures do grow well in 15 days pulmonary secretion and then you can further send them for first line and the second line drug sensitivity so this is very important to understand then how what is the mode which is very important question everybody asks you you always tell for uh, having an AFB smear but how should we collect it so importantly at all center we know how to take a gastric aspirate. go for this one or twice uh, uh, two or times then you should be also knowing about the induced sputum though it, it is done in a very well uh, environment which is having the HEPA filters but at least uh, it can be done and with that also the bacilli or the sputum can be collected and if there's a pulmonary lesion then should always go for bronchial watch if available because that is the best uh, way to collect sample which is pure. So there was a study done in all Indian Institute of Medical Sciences 
in which they have compared with fiber optic bronchoscopy and BAL and also in GA. Both of them always have a good yield, but BAL improved yield of AFD by 29% over the gastric aspirates. Bronchoscopy findings of the mucosal involvement was more likely to yield AFD in BAL. So this is also important wherever possible because we have to treat the resistant man. We don't want a child to uh, keep on having uh, ATT and without having uh, after two months down the line, the child is not improving and we are not able to uh, recognize it having a resistance or not. So better to go for a better mode of collecting the sputum sample. So this, if every, if everything is visible, so I'll uh, talk about this now, uh, shift. So this now, mostly the diagnosis come by the clinical. So which shows that the persistent fever for more than two weeks with an, uh, a known case and or unremitting cough for more than two weeks and or weight loss of 5% or no weight gain past three months despite adequate treatment and nutrition and failure of nutrition with or without contact with any case. So it is better, always better to ask the contact with any case, but if it is not there, these are the main point, having persistent fever more than two weeks, unremitting cough for more than two weeks, you have already ruled out other causes of cough and fever, there's a weight loss or at least the weight gain is not there, then possibly, or if you find a, even pulmonary contact, most of the time we find a contact, then you're possibly with uh, clinically diagnosed uh, pulmonary uh, tuberculosis. So what should we do in that? So you should go for direct chest X-ray. Now we used to go for hemogram, PPD, now go for chest X-ray. Chest X-ray, if it is highly suggestive, then possibly that uh, you have to go for any uh, sputum uh, has to be taken out, either with the expectorant by the gastric aspirates or, or by the uh, uh, bronchoscopy or by the uh, induced sputum and you send it for NAD testing. Okay, if NAD testing comes positive, then obviously microbiologically confirmed TB case is there. And accordingly, you go for if there's any risk resistance or not. If it is detected, then you have to reconfirm again and follow the DRTB patient. And according to that, we have to give the treatment. If risk resistance is not detected, then you have to go with the first line regime, which I talked about the, the category, which I talked about the six months thing. So this is important. Next, if chest X-ray have a non-specific shadow, you are having this fever, cough and everything, but there's some non-specific shadows, then you give a course of appropriate antibiotics. If you have not given before, if you've given it, it is fine. If it is not given, you can give it. And again, repeat the X-ray. Now, if there's a persistence of shadow, then you go for try to collect the sputum sample and go for NAD testing. If the NAD testing comes positive, then the same thing has to be done. It's a microbiologically confirmed case. If it comes negative, what to do with that? Look for other signs and significant enlarged peripheral means there are some clinical symptoms, but the excess uh, specific shadows are still there and they are persistent. Then possibly you are dealing with them, but you have to look for any other Enlarged peripheral lymph nodes is there, or you have to go for, uh, you have to look for that, only uh, uh, abdominal symptoms are there, then you might take a specimen, better quality specimen from them, and then go further ahead. Again, it is positive, then you have to go with the same treatment. If it is negative, then you have to uh, repeat the test and uh, of these induced or feasible splinter if it is possible. And then if it is not likely, then you have to follow the patient. He may not be having tuberculosis. So uh, then you come, if the chest X-ray is totally normal, but the sign and symptoms are there. So possibly we are not dealing with pulmonary TB, we are dealing with extra pulmonary TB. Again, you have to see with the investigations like uh, any other uh, lymph nodes are involved or uh, abdominal uh, in front and may require some CECT scan or bronchoscopy or further investigation. If you're not able to find that also, please follow the child and refer to a higher center. So this is very important. Not go away with Montu testing and then further, this is clinical and radiological. Okay. So I first discussed two cases, very good, interesting cases. It's a 14-year-old girl with a complaint of fever, loss of appetite, weight loss for 20 days, dry cough for 10 days, and some chest pain. She was telling her chest pain and she was not uh, gaining weight. In fact, had a weight loss. There was no history of contact with Cox, according to the parents, but there was one friend she used to go for tuitions or whatever, and she's not very sure of it. 
On examination, the systemic examination was normal. The chest had fine crepitations. And on investigation, the ESR was high, did up onto it from outside, which was 6 mm. So what to do with that? Though we know it is a pulmonary TB or may not be, this is a chest x -ray. So these we can find is some confluent, small, 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 small shadow. If it is seen, it seems to be a millary type of picture, more in the lower lobes as compared to the upper lobes. But she was not expurating any sputum or she was not, she was just a dry cough was there. Twice I told, told them to go and nebulize themselves or, uh, and get sputum of it was not possible so we went for bronchoscopy in that case even the gastric aspirate was done to consecutive samples there was no positive history uh, of tuberculosis uh, then the gastric aspirate came negative the bronchoscopy was attempted on that there was secretion there was a normal mucosa and anatomy and bowel was sent for afb panel in that we found it was a smear positive for afb and which uh, was shown in first 24 hours. I started with the category one, this two HR, the deep, uh, four HRE. It's not missed, missed a little, but not the category one, but the, uh, the same regime which I talked about. CBNAT was also sent with the bowel sample, which came after two or three days, which was MTB was detected risk resistance. But the patient was followed, remained symptomatic. But I had no culture during that time, which I could see if it's INH resistance or not. It had mild relief, but still the cough and the fever was continuing. The bowel culture report came after 15 days, which shows riff resistant, but INH was sensitive and other uh, first line was also sent. This is possibly a case of a DRTB riff resistant and the other first line drugs were negative. But after that also, we should also see for the second line drug. HIV ELISA test was negative. So in the previous uh, chart, every patient of tuberculosis need to get the HIV done. So please get HIV done for every child who is suspected of pulmonary TB or you have diagnosed them microbiologically positive TB case. So patient and the family were consulted regarding this TRTB. Duration, cost and side effects of the treatment were being told. Option to also go to the tuberculosis TB center, but they continued with the treatment. The bar sensitivity for the second line drugs was also done. At this time, you can do for LPA also, but LPA was a little not available. So the same we went up. Then this uh, second line drugs were negative and only this one, so this child was started on the regime of ethionamide, uh, INH, pyrazinamide, moxifloxacin, canamycin, and, and uh, clofazamine. Cyclosine and clofazamine was started for four months, and she's still on follow-up. She's became better. Now it is to be continued for another eight months, and after one year, we can stop it. In between, we got the sputum. Again, she was not producing sputum, but her X-ray had dramatically improved. This child was monitored for her side effects like hearing, vision, LFT, and KFT. This I want to uh, find it out that even we are finding these DRTB cases. Now, this child could have been missed if the GA was negative, the sputum was not getting, the patient could have started on the regime, and we were not having some any diagnosis by that form. And we could have started with on treatment. Again, the child is not well. After two months, if I'm going to do a bronchoscopy, I may not be able to get the pure uh, sputum for this diagnosis. So in the advance only when we did it, we found the child was risk resistant. And this way, the things were, in fact, in private practice only, we were able to manage this child and managing the RTB patients also, and they are improving by monitoring their good side effects. So another case, this was a recent case. Now she's much better. She's a 16 year old girl having a cervical lymph node. She came to me after eight months of treatment. We should took it from outside, inadequate doses, but her sinus had never restarted. She said that, yeah, I'm again having fever and the lymph node size was not decreasing. No other symptom was there. Only fever, lymph node was not decreasing. It was oozing a little. There was no mediastinal adenopathy. The abdominal was normal. So she thought that probably now this is the time to uh, stop my treatment and doctor still I'm not well. So I retested her lymph node FNAC, got it done with a CBNAT and the smear. The smear came negative, but the CBNAT detected very low uh, tuberculosis bacteria and which was RIF sensitive. So, but I had no specimen for culture. So that is why I started on, restarted on the treatment again, the proper adequate doses. And she, and there was a complete remission. She's much better. Now we're going to stop the treatment after six months. So this is the way because during this time, the lymph node was so small, only they were able to gather only 0.5 to 1 ml of the sample. So culture could not be sent. So this way we can, we have to reassess every case individually, how much the symptoms are there. If you are able to take out the sample with a small specimen also, go for CBNAT, CBNAT and CBNAT, which is very important. So now the doses we all know has changed. The isoniazide is still on the higher dose. So with the average of 10 milligram per kg per day and the 
sorry, maximum of 300, rifampicin by 15 milligram per kg per day with a maximum of 600, pyrazinamide again by 35 milligram per kg per day. And uh, I think we can go 1500 and more than that is a little difficult, but I've seen after 1500, the uric acid start increasing. So you have to be a little more cautious uh, how much maximum you have to give. So streptomycin we are not using right now. Ethambutol, 20 milligram per kg. So according to this is important. No, we are not getting such uh, regimes in the private uh, setup, though we have to do it according to what is available, the dispersible tablet according to these doses. But in the government setup, they are being dispersed by three drugs FDC with the INH of 50, 75, 150, and you get an ethambutol 100 mg. So according to the bandwidth and all, these are being distributed to them. And the flow drug regime of FDC with H75, R150, 400, and E275. So according to them, this is the band regime, which is 4 to 7 uh, kg weight. They require just one uh, uh, one thing of the three drug regime and one ethambutol. And then it goes further by two and two ethambutol, 3P3E, 4P4E, and then they come to the adult. So the crux is that the doses should be according to that. Even in private practice, you can do that. With uh, We don't have that fixed dose regime, but we have the other uh, drugs in which you can always uh, uh, adjust the doses, which is very important. Adequately treated. Still date, we are getting such prescription which are giving under treatment. Again, the same manner. We are not giving ICS for such a long time. Ki unko to koi na koi problem ho jayegi. To this is the way I am high dose nahi dekhte. TB ke koi na koi problem ho jayegi. No, this is required to eradicate TB fully. So. Uh, this is an important change again of the prophylaxis to be given and how to be given. We have seen, these are the recent guidelines also which have been published, 5 to 10% of exposed children to pulmonary TB case, they develop disease after two years. Mind it, this is very difficult, very easy to read prophylaxis, but very difficult to give. Right now, we're getting such patients in which parents are not agreeing to get their children like if a 14-year-old child I'm uh, treating, I'm telling them to get their five-year-old child, a 10-year-old child, or seven-year-old child, get an X-ray, get it done, get a uh, PPD done from us. I don't think so. They're getting. There are very few patients who are getting their normal child. But there are few children. Few. Uh, they have found that they will not agree right now. But after two years down the line, when the children are going to have bad TB, then they will recognize. So please offer prophylaxis to all pulmonary TB cases who are exposed to them. Now, what is a shift? Because this risk increases in HIV co-infections. Latent TB to be diagnosed either by a PPD2 TU or you can go for ICRA2. So this is important. At this point, this PPD2 TU better. Now we're getting the strength of 2 TU. So better go for 2 TU, which is available. We have to order for that. So what is a shift? This is a shift. People living with HIV infected uh, area, not uh, give, um, who are getting the ART too, even uh, not ART, the adults and the children more than 12 months of the age, they need to straight away go for prophylaxis. When a TPI to be offered after ruling out active TB disease, you have to just rule out active TB and you have to give TPT. I'll tell, talk about TPT. Then infant less than 12 months with HIV contact, they all have to be given TPT. And household contact below five years of the pulmonary TB case. Say if you have a grandparent or any child, uh, any patient, 14, 15, 13, who has got pulmonary TB, you are able, you know that there's a pulmonary TB, he might have been not able to collect the sputum, but they are a big risk for children below five years of the age. They need to get prophylaxis, just to rule out TB and need to get prophylaxis. Mela, you know, may not, this now recommendation, do not go for TPI in this case. Just, just rule out TB, active TB in the form of symptoms, radiology, if you find it normal, straight away go for TB. You may not do TPI. So this is important. Or in the household contact, five years and above of pulmonary TB cases, in this, you have to uh, TPT among TBI positive after ruling out TB disease it means you can go for a test of latent TBI and then you offer them TBT if it is positive. So what is the testing? Chest X-ray and TBI testing would be offered wherever possible, but TPT must not be tested. Say, if TPT uh, Lamontu is not available with you or you're not having ICRA or something, then please go and give them prophylaxis. Do not wait for that. Just get the X-ray done and that is all. So this is important. 
So what is the uh, course duration? People living with HIV, adults and children more than 12 months, infant less than 12 months in contact with active TB and household contact below five years of the pulmonary TB cases, they all need six months daily isoniazide therapy. They all need, it is only just rule out active TB. That is all. If they have active TB, give them the full treatment. If no active TB, give them six months of daily isoniazide. Another option is three months weekly of isoniazide and rifapentin, but uh, this is difficult to get it in practice. So I think six months isoniazide along with pyridoxine to be given by 10 milligram per kg per day. Because since we are giving 6H, which is uh, uh, 10 milligram per kg per day, H is in the higher doses, so pyridoxine should also be given to them. Then the household contacts five years and above of the pulmonary TB case. Again, if you found that they are TPT positive, the, uh, the latent TB is there, then you have to give them isoniazide and rifampicin or six months of uh, INH daily along with pyridoxine. And uh, then comes the other risk group like children on immunosuppressant like nephrotic syndrome, uh, silicosis, anti-tumor necrosis factor, whatever, they also need this prophylaxis irrespective of their TPI only rule out active TB. So testing for TBI by TST or IGRA is not a requirement for initiating TBT in HIV or children aging less than five years in contact with pulmonary TB. If you don't have this facility, do not go for it. Straight away, asymptomatic child, no symptoms of TB, you have ruled out active infections, give them the treatment of prophylaxis. Tell them that this child can have after two years symptoms, disease, sorry. So it is better to give them. So this is very important. And in children with a household contact above five years and adult, TSC or IGRA testing would be offered wherever possible. If you don't have this, then start away prophylaxis. If you have it, if they are coming positive with that, then give them prophylaxis. So this is very important. Uh, in which situation need not to be given? In active TB diseases, obviously this is not required because you have to treat them properly. Acute or chronic hepatitis, then you have to just think that if L LFTs are getting uh, deranged, then you can wait for that time to the time they're better and then start it. The recurrent use of other hepatitis medication like such as uh, Neverprint, with that it's a little difficult. So other than Neverprint, you can give that. Regular and heavy alcohol consumption, which is not there in children as such, and in symptoms of peripheral neuropathy like persistent tingling, numbness, and burning other than the disease, other than the uh, pyridoxine deficiency, or any allergy or known hypersensitivity to any drugs being considered for TPT. So this is very clear, the prophylaxis part. Right now, we should offer to all our patients. Uh, if anybody wants to go for the drug-resistant TB, I can go fast, for, fast with it. And uh, if you're suspecting any patient with a drug-resistant TB, you have to get the MGIT culture in the specimen. And if you found them the way where I did the first case, if they are RRTB, the resistance is there with rifampicin, go for the second line LPA. And if you are suspecting... Uh, but both you have to go for first line and the second line LPA. If the first line LPA means uh, if you have already tested for the first line drug like INH and uh, ethambutol and the other drugs, then if they are S sensitive, then and R positive, then there's another there's a drug gene which I talked about. If they are uh, sorry, if they are sensitive. Sorry, sorry. Now this is the rifampicin sensitive TB and this is the resistant TB. If they are sensitive. And they are found to be S sensitive, the sensitive, uh, it's a drug sensitive, then you have to go, go over to the same regime. If they are resistant sensitive, but H is resistant, then you have to replace H with the levoflox and, and, and do the give the treatment for six months. The regime is different. Now, if they have resistance with TB, you have to go for the you have found that there's a rif resistance, you have to go for first line also and second line also. Second line is very important. If you are second uh, uh, testing with second line, then you are testing with fluoroquinolones and SLI, which is levofloxacin, septomycin, and other. Since if they are sensitive to these, then the, there is a different regime. If they are positive, then they are XDRTB. Then the regime is different. So any other time, if they are uh, uh, there's some discordance with the LPA or the RRTB, repeat the CBNAT, and then again go for the same thing. This is for your own knowledge that if you find a NAT sample to have RIF resistant, they should always, and the patient is not improving, then possibility that you are, might be dealing with INH resistant too, 
simple. If you are sending that for LPA or the MGIT culture, you're finding the H resistance also there along with R resistance is there or, uh, uh, or uh, resistance, then the treatment regime is different. But sometimes if your child is not improving and in the CBNAD you form it as resistant to, so sensitive to risk, but still the child is not improving. If you have that specimen with you, you can always go for first line LPA or the MGIT. You can order them, basically how you have to order them. They will throw away the sample. Whenever the culture goes, you have to follow them. You have to say that we have first line sensitivity cut out, it's a little bit mangy, around 5 to 8, 5 to 6,000 at post. It will be benefited to the child. And then if you find edge resistance, simply you have to just change the regime. Means without that, you have to go first L in that case and give it to the child. So this is important to determine resistance in that case. If you're finding it both, then if you're able to manage them, fine. If you're not able to manage them, then refer to the higher center. This is important to understand. So this is all I want to talk about. Any questions? Thank you, just, uh, Dr. Jasmeet. That was an excellent presentation, both on resistance and uh, primary approach to TB. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Jasmeet, if you can stop sharing your screen. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. Yeah, it's OK. And specifically, the case-based approach was a very welcome approach. Directly, you go to your clinic and start associating with different cases. And all the cases, they were really brilliant. Good. Thank you. Uh, we'll start with any comments by Dr. Shalini, your experience. Oh, I find it very difficult to remember all drug resistant regimes, you know. Yeah. So every, <laughs> I can't. I remember. have it on my desk. <laughs> I have to look at every time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So every patient, INH resistance, okay, I'll come and go back to the theory. It's yeah. very difficult. It's very confusing. <laughs> It's easy for me, I refer it to them. I refer it to you people. But, you know, oh. it's, and uh, treating a drug resistant case is, you know, I say act, even as bad as treating a malignancy case. It is so difficult for children to tolerate these medicines and to complete that two years of course is a very, very so we challenging. We don't have two years of course, no, ma'am, Dr. Shalini. And Basically, nice life resistance thing. only, no, no, two years have gone out. No, uh, there are no injectables also initially. No, there's only injectables no, in this. Because because gastritis only. and vomiting happen. Yeah, no, it, I tell you what, less than five years, we do not find much of resistance. Only when the adult case are resistant and they're adolescents, not adolescents. adolescents, yeah. Adolescents. I have two children of adolescent, basically, 14, 15, 16, and they are able to tolerate. One I'm getting of lymph node also, it's a chinky type of patient comes to me, uska pura dono se sensitivity, uh, dono se resistant nikla. He could not get the fluoroprenol, he didn't have any money. But I started with the regime of riff resistance and H. Ka, chalo, karte hai, but he improved. But only thing we have to get the LFT done, pyrazinamide se uric acid bohat badta hai, even LFT bhi derange hote hai, then you have to taper it down, but they improved. Even the fixed rate <laughs> combination, jab ek yeah. 40 kg or ek 12 year, 14 year ko dena padta hai na, there is a big mental block. Often yeah. parents and child feels ki sir, 6 goli leni hai, 7 goli leni hai. Koi baat nahi. Do, Koi baat nahi, that is okay is for us. That is okay for yeah. them. That is okay. But they have this mental block, you know, compliance issue, acceptance. Uh, yeah. For the time that because so we should recommend ki bhai jo double dose of P jo hai na, double combination like 75, 50 uh, or 150 ke saath, we should have 150, 100, and 600 also. Yes, yes. But we have it like, they call McCox plus kid DT, and a uh, problem is that ZH 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 is that Ma'am, how can you give that? How can you give that? If you give that, 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 it's going to puke out everything. All the things that you're taking capsules, patient is taking or not? No, it's not taking capsules. It's not taking capsules. It's not taking capsules. I would differ in that, you know. The whole, this concept, because we treat cystic fibrosis on, the concept is that the throat of a child of three-year-old age is capable to gulp a capsule. So to teach them, we start with gems. Gems yeah. nikal lo, ye nikal lo, and then wo gradually usme aa jata hai. 
बहुत पेशेंस चाहिए होती है सेपरेटली So that Better. my doses are completely right. We no, don't use any fixed drug combinations, and we work on the side. My pester, what? Can we open a small, small, small pester? Take, take, or take? Or only thing that it has to begin in even in an hour. This is very important to say. Because don't divide them morning, evening. 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 So this is the only challenge. What we get in the initial, they are puking them out, getting a call in the morning at ten o'clock, nine o'clock. Ma'am, this is the dawai I nikal di sari. So ma'am, again, to bara dekhte hain. So some challenges there, but gradually they learn. There is a question by Dr. Sabina, Dr. Jasmeet. So there is no categorization like category one and two. Yes, there is no categorization. Only one is there, which is two HRZ plus. Uh, uh, For HRE, and every case has to be first assessed for resistance, and then only you go further. There is no of two and three, and the lymph node also needs to be the same treatment. Do not give HRE for in the initial beginning. Pleural infusion also needs the same treatment. Pulmonary, extra pulmonary, all of them. Only rule out resistance. Uh, Doctor Jasmeet, I have a question. Now, if we are in a resource setting, you know, and if I signed a case with the drug sensitive rifampicin sensitive tuberculosis, so uh, should I start uh, the treatment? Of course, has to be started. Yeah. Does it make sense that even in this case, send for the LP in the same center, same sample to look for the INH resistance? If they are look, look, if you have collected the sample and you have the facility for LP, you should always think it. Yes. Because no, you should always because few uh, cases, very few. If they are not responding, you have the sample and you can always have an anionic sensitivity part. So that is why for every case, I always collect it for culture. Either LP. We do it. We do it. MGIT culture. Now, if you have ordered say sputum, three no cheese you order only smear, CBNAT. And yeah, we call it expert plus, and that we do uh, with everything. Only, ma'am, with LPA there is one problem. Mm -hmm. LPA, I mean, if the smear is not getting positive, then they LPA need a bigger sample. It is decreased, yeah. So culture is the best. Fifteen, twenty days, may keep on following it. तब तक तो बच्चा ट्रीटमेंट लेगा वन एंड हाफ टू मंथ तक नहीं हो रहा आपके पास वो है आपने बस उसको आगे फर्स्ट लाइन के लिए ऑर्डर करना है. If they're able to spend money. Get it done, which is very important. I think the most difficult thing is to get the sample, and if you have the yeah, sample, yeah, that is the most difficult thing. Have a monetary, thing. it's better to go for it. Go for it. Once you have already isolated. Second question is, Doctor Manish, I have to tell you, bronchoscopy, I can do it everything. Patient, no, agree with that. No, no, madam, just be it. Now, balgam, nikal lenge. Man, but nikalo. अगर नहीं वो शुरू में तो एग्री हो जाएगा उसको बाद में एग्री करवाना और मुश्किल है वो कहता है पार्शियली तो ठीक हो चुका है नाउ व्हाई डू यू वांट टू डू दिस हां तो वो एक प्रॉब्लम वही चैलेंज है टू टेक आउट द सैंपल और दिस अनदर चैलेंज ये जो एडवांस सीबी नॉट आ गया वेयर दे आर डिटेक्टिंग वेरी लेस नंबर ऑफ बैक्टीरिया पॉजिटिव उसमें रिफ्रामपेसिन सेंसिटिविटी दे समटाइम्स दे से दैट इट कैन नॉट बी अ सर्टेन बिकॉज़ दे नीड लार्जर सैंपल टू टेल मी दैट यू नो सो आई हैव हैड वन केस Where in the CB not was positive, and they could not comment on the rifampicin sensitivity mm -hmm. because the quantity was less. You mm -hmm. know, so we went on a, a clinical treatment only. Mm -hmm. But is there anything else that we can do in these children? We send for a culture. I tell you what, one more thing which is coming up. Uh, it is need to be standardized. It is stool CB not. I think you must have all read. Those patients with pulmonary TB now they are doing stool. Few one of the uh, literature was also there. I think two years back they published one and a half year. It is that you uh, take out a gastric aspirate and you take out a stool. They take the stool of the child and go for CB net. In that they found they almost equal, but till date the standardization of stool specimen is not yet standardized that to be uh, in, uh, that to be implicated in the NTEP. But stool specimen is again which is coming up. So, case. what about pooling? Pooling a sputum and trying to take a deep nasopharyngeal suctions and gastric aspirates? None. 
nothing 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 induce sputum is the best if you are able to do it and we do induce sputum but that is the best the best that is the way you have to do it nebulize everything you have done it then the child cuffs and you take the throat so this is very good even the studies have done that and then bronchoscopy we have to do it you have to just tell the patient you have to just prophylaxis is the major problem right now prophylaxis it is, is very it's a challenge. very difficult it is, i'm telling you one patient stop following me ki ma'am ne kaha dusre bachche ko le karo this is the way they can in ke paas hi jana so it is a big and one uh, family is coming uh, the maid had pulmonary tb and they were very nice unhone do doctors consult kiye unka nahi nahi aapko prophylaxis deni chahiye then they read about it then they came to me main ka ma'am ye side effects to nahi hoyenge main ka nothing do it you are very good patient please give and the child was one year old so i have to start prophylaxis they still very spectacular agar thoda sa ulti ho ta ma'am liver effect ho gaya kuch nahi hua just give it so and the maid goes it. away from the house even then you will ask for three months she was there for two months ma'am and she was pulmonary tb positive no yes. even if she goes away the patient is exposed See, and the, the child already is already exposer is there na no? that has to be given and it is i tell you what i did a ppt to to you it was negative chest x ray negative but prophylaxis need to be started but abhi to ye kehte hain wo bhi mat karo par bahar kehte hain na ma'am test pehle kar lo agar uspe aayega to denge tab ki now it is a recommendation don't do it still give it but they don't understand no and the challenge is with the drug resistant tuberculosis what yeah. to do with the contacts of drug resistant tuberculosis you have uh, no we actually dr unhone to sangeeta ne to hame bola you can start with 6l which is not a problem i have started in patient with 6l but it is still not recognized and not matlab uh, standardized not uh, included in the program so, so i am saying it off way about... yeah i am just saying off way but not right but we, so i we had this uh, one month old child 3 years ago yeah. and we had to separate the child from the mother uh, they tell to follow they tell to follow them bas abhi okay. right now no 6l this is what yes okay thank you we will conclude this whole session i think we had very interactive sessions thanks to dr uh, jasmeet kaur for her excellent session on tb guidelines and thanks dr shalini for being throughout there and helping in all the sessions thank, thank you. you thanks a lot and thanks dr mandeep dr mandeep you are logged in but not there thank you dr manish for the opportunity it was so yeah. good to listen ah, to the i want to thank the organizer it has been learning it's a big learning for us also that every time we present and learn more about it thank you very much dr okay Manish. thank you thank you dr somya so we'll log out thank you everyone bye bye good evening goodbye